Hello everyone, welcome to what if Issei got betrayed and become the Crimson Dragon God of Arcadia Part 7. Before we start please go support Rage Raven and Dark Decade 97 for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. Over 2. The 501st Legion. Jean's office, 9.30 am. Issei, Nyx and Invictus were present at Jean's office, they were present for their first day at the Arcadian military, well only Nyx and Invictus. Issei already had two military experiences already and was able to strategize and almost succeed in his missions. As for the others, they are here because these were the two people Issei chose as his second in command of the Legion that Issei is going to have. So these are the two you have chosen for your second in command, General. Issei nodded as he spoke. Indeed, Supreme General, these are the two of my most trusted friends in my group, if there is anyone I can trust it is them and my family. Jean nodded in understanding as she spoke, very well and this is your first experience in the army, right? Yes, Supreme General, this is our first experience. Invicta spoke with an understanding tone, he was aware on how the army works and was happy when his superior general was going to be his partner and best friend Issei, who had offered him a place in the army, he was glad to accept that in his stead. Nix nodded in agreement to Invictus's words as she spoke. So we will be starting with the rank of private, right? Nix asked to which Jean responded. Yes and no, your rank will be higher since Issei will be the one promoting you in your battalion, so that is one thing you must keep in mind of course, he needs my approval, then your promotion will be confirmed, so worry not about that. The duo nodded as Issei was silent, he was well briefed on what he needed to do and what were his responsibilities. As for Jean, she was well aware that Issei won't promote anyone without her permission and has a lot of trust and faith in him. Here is the rank list, if you need. Jean pointed to a board that displayed the ranks which they did take note of, they knew that Issei being a general warranted a high number of responsibility and handling. Jean looked at Issei, he probably would be the youngest general in the Arcadian army, and some of the council were worried that it would be putting pressure on the boy who has not even reached adulthood, however several believed that he would be fine, and nobody is perfect, even if he fails, he can learn from him. Issei, being a general is having a lot of responsibility you have to lead and defend a very big army of troops and other legions, and you must protect your army like your very own, you are young Issei, you are not immune to not making mistakes so if you need me for guidance, or any of the generals, just let us know, alright. Dean's tone held concern for the boy, he was thrusted into a situation where only adults should handle, even John is just a captain, which is pretty high, but regardless, being a general at the age of 21 is just a very rare occasion. Additionally, she was worried that he may not have the mental fortitude just yet, given that Juniper seemed rather reluctant on divulging his past. She knew he had a terrible past and that may affect his decision making, that is why he needed guidance so that he could be powerful and efficient general in war. Supreme General, you can be rest assured, I will come to you if I need your guidance. Jean nodded in understanding as suddenly a teleportation circle was opened up. Recognizing this to be Juniper's circle, they noticed her approaching in her usual attire. I hope I am not late Juniper spoke with a sigh, she was talking with a certain assassin about Issei and she was interested in joining the general in his army. No, you are not Empress. Jean greeted the Empress as she then spoke. Ah Issei, there is someone that was interested in joining your battalion and yes, she is someone from your past Issei and Nyx widened their eyes while Invictus and Jean were confused as to who it can be. Issei then asked with a slight concern. Are you sure she would be interested knowing what happened to me? Juniper nodded as she asked, Ice, do you trust me? I do Juniper then nodded as she spoke, then believe me, this one is a good variation of someone you once cared for, and she is nothing like her. Issei nodded, as soon a magic circle opened up revealing a lavender-haired woman with orange eyes, she wore a military jumpsuit which consisted of a zipper suit, tight track pants and military grade armor. Issei and Nyx became wide-eyed knowing who exactly was in front of them, or at least who looked like her, while Nyx was worried knowing how it would affect Issei, the latter was surprised, knowing that this person looked like the woman he would have once loved. Ice, Nyx, Invictus, meet Ingvold Leviathan, an assassin under my command, a part of the shadows, Juniper explained as Issei and Nyx never thought there would be an Arcadian variant of the woman that was completely turned against Issei by Dai and his harem. No way how can this be? Nyx muttered in surprise, this was the first time she would be meeting alternates of the people in this world, as Juniper spoke. Nyx, it's a long story I will explain later. Nyx looked at Issei who seemed reluctant on accepting her, as Juniper spoke with a concerned tone. Ice, know this I brought Ingvold here knowing what kind of a person, she is not like her from your past have faith in me, and you promised me something, remember? Juniper spoke as she continued, you promised to confront your past and fight against it, right? Are you going to let your past decide what is going to be your future? The others minus Nyx were confused as to what exactly happened, Juniper had a gut feeling that there is a chance, moderate chance, Issei would decline her, simply because she looks and sounds just like the Ingvold from his earth. 
Additionally, this Ingvold was completely different from the Ingvold of Issei's Earth. She was a half-elf, half-demon, from the Kingdom of Demons, and was one of Juniper's most trusted. She was a big fan of Issei's work and always wanted to meet him, but never got the chance to do so. She looked at Ingvold, confused at what was going on. If only she knew what kind of a person the Ingvold Issei was familiar with. Issei looked down for a moment before speaking, fine, I will accept her, Juniper gave a smile, as she was happy that Issei had taken the second step in accepting and confronting his past, while Engvold was beaming at this, she was going to work with someone she looked up to. So tell me who you are, and what rank are you in the military? Engvold nodded as she spoke, my name is Engvold Leviathan, I am a half-elf and a half-demon, hailing from the kingdom of demons. I was actually in Empress's shadows, which are assassins working under direct control by the Empress herself. My rank in the military is major, and it would be nice to work under you General Haidu. Ingvold bowed before Issei, as she soon raised her head up. Nyx was surprised by this, although she was happy that Issei was confronting his past. She would take some time to getting used to this Arcadian variant of Ingvold, given Issei had told her of Arcadian variants of both Rias and Raswas. So that means, you four will be confirmed for the army, right? The four mentioned nodded, as Jean asked with a smile, any names for your trooper? Yes I was thinking the 501st Battalion, what do you say? Nix retorted in a tone of annoyance. That's such a lame name, Issei Issei had his jaw drop as he spoke with a retort, come on Nix, I thought so hard in naming my battalion, this is so not fair. Yeah, your obsession with outer space related stuff is why you named your battalion after that, haven't you? Issei tried his best to explain when Drake responded, oh partner, you always wanted to name your troopers after those space movies you used to love watching. Not fair, not you too Drake Issei retorted in response as Jean and Juniper chuckled seeing Issei in this state. Juniper thought seeing this, looking back, they even have the same habit of giving bad names to their battalions and even 501st in a way is sort of original 15, just in a different manner in terms of naming. Ingvold and Invictus were sweat dropping, seeing the banter between, as Issei tried to convince Nyx to accept the name, with the latter playing hard to do so. However she eventually relented and spoke. Fine, I accept the name but I was expecting you to name it after the Red Dragon Emperor, or something similar to that Invictus nodded in agreement as he mused, why not chose that name? I just didn't to make it too extravagant, Issei spoke while rubbing his back earning understanding nods from everyone, as Jean grunted garnering everyone's attention. Speaking of troops, Issei won't be having just a battalion, he will be having a legion and different divisions in that legion so, I would advise you to change your name from 501st Battalion to 501st Legion. Issei nodded in understanding as he responded, yes, yes I will. Juniper seemed to be happy, however she soon remembered something a certain Redeed had asked her to do so. She then spoke, oh Issei, this reminds me dot dot Rias wanted to speak to you about the legion, you should go talk to her whenever you get the time. Issei was surprised as he asked, but wait, why would she want to talk about it? I have only met her twice, the latter being by sheer coincidence. Issei remembered their second meeting after he had done his graduation, where the two had decided to talk about the army and Rhea's life as a major, and having her own PMC, it was a normal chat, and Rhea's greatly respected that Issei risked his life to protect the Empress with his life and made sure she was alright. That is what she had requested me to do so so I would advise you to meet her when you are ready. Issei nodded in understanding as he pondered on when Rias would be ready to talk to her. While well, Nix, Invictus and Ingvold wondered what was going to happen from here on out. Scene change. Issei, Ingvold, Nix and Invictus were all heading towards the main headquarters where Rias had invited them to meet up. They eventually meet up at the building where they are greeted with several units that were a part of the PMC military corporation that Rias owned. General, Major is expecting your presence. General, Major is expecting your presence Issei and company nodded as they were soon led inside by the troopers as they eventually reached Rhea's room, which was a darkened Victorian era based room. Rhea's was having a cup of tea as she greeted Issei and the rest of the company. It's nice to meet you once again, Issei, or should I call you General, since you are obviously my superior. Issei shook his head and responded, just Issei would do, we are not in the military, Major. In that case, please call me Rhea's. Issei nodded as Rias soon looked at the others and greeted them. And you all are. My name is Nyx, the primordial goddess of darkness from Issei's world, it is nice to meet you Rias Gremory. Invictus was the next to follow. And mine is Invictus, a Grim from the Grim Kingdom, I was Issei's partner while he was in his JROTC training Rias nodded as she spoke. I see so you are the one that worked on the cosmic juggernaut. Invictus nodded as he remembered on how hard the train was to design. Even when Issei used the power of infinity on the train, the Saulium was still unable to take it, it took them several tries to get the thing working. And when they succeeded, the train was nothing but a marvel to look. 
The cosmic juggernaut or the ninth god key which is say developed chronologically, is described to be a huge steam locomotive, which had a Victorian era style design comprising of black and golden. However, underneath it, it was a luxury train that has all the latest accommodations, including a Wi-Fi that runs in the train. Back at the present, Ingvold is the next to introduce herself, my name is Ingvold Leviathan, I am an half-elf and a half-demon, hailing from the kingdom of demons. I was actually in Empress's shadows, which are assassins working under direct control by the Empress herself. My rank in the military is major. No need to be so formal with me, Ingvold, we are not in the military. Rhea spoke with a smile, as Ingvold nodded in understanding as she soon spoke, so I think the Empress must have informed you as to why I wanted to talk, right? Issei nodded as he spoke, yep so you are interested in joining the 501st. Yes, and not just me, two of the Shadow Company members as well are also in Issei had a feeling that there is a high chance of them being Arcadian variants of Issei's old world. May I know why did you wish to join me? I mean, in our last mission, you do know how I was, right? Rias noted this, as she spoke, but you forget one thing you were the reason that Frisia was even corned, she was unable to escape, and you had her in the ropes, had it not been for Vlad ambushing me, we would have even captured her your leadership skills, and strategy is what even made this successful, and you even took out several of the black arms that had infiltrated the city. Rias explained her case, as she responded, despite your shortcomings, your strategy and power is not something to scoff at, and you even had before you became a general, you prioritized my safety over the mission, and had it not been for you, I would be dead, and I or we would be happy to serve under your command, General Haidu. I I am flattered Rias I would be happy to accept you into the 501st Legion, Rias smiled back to Issei's words, as Nix noted that she was nothing like the spoiled brat from their world. She took accountability for her failure, and blamed herself for the mission. She was really mature and much better than the Rias of their world. And my shadow company, I can assure you they are quite adept, Rias spoke with a tone of assurance, as Issei spoke, I am not saying no, but how can I say yes, when I don't even know who they are. Very well, I understand Rias got her scroll and sent a message, as soon enough a knock was heard as Rias spoke with a smile. Hum inside the four minus Ingvold looked at the four in surprise, as the first was described to be a girl with white hair and gold eyes. She wore a military outfit just like Rias would have worn, with a camo vest, white full-sleeved shirt and a black pants. She wore a cat hairpin and had two belts, one having several grenades and the other having several pouches. This was Kaneko Taoju, a faunus. The second person was described to be a brown-haired woman who wore specs and had messy hair. She wore spectacles and had brown eyes. She wore a military tracksuit which had two buttons, a full pants with a belt having two pouches. This was Ika Kiryu, a resident living in Arcadia. Meet the other members of the Shadow Company, Kaneko Taoju, they would be the ones that are interested to join the 501st Legion. Issei and Nix were surprised, they never thought that these two would be a part of the Shadow Company as well. In terms of relationship in the old world, Kaneko Taoju always gave him spiteful glares, warning him to stay away from her else he will get beaten up, which has happened once or twice, and since she always was with Dai, she could be easily manipulated. Issei also did so as she asked him to do. His worst tormentors were Rias and Akeno in the Grimmery Peerage, while well, Kaneko kept her distance from him, despite once or twice beating him up when he was framed for peeking. With Ika, things were different, they barely knew each other and did not even cross paths, even with Dai around. Ika Kiryu was also a well-known pervert, and she did not hide it, yet what angered Issei the most was how differently Kuo treated them, while well, Ika was still a person they would talk to, Issei was the polar opposite, he was beaten and tortured. He hated what happened to him because of just lies, caused by his so-called brother, and his life was as miserable as possible. But this was Arcadia, Rias was a completely different person here, and there is a high, no complete chance that these two girls are also not the same. He also promised the Empress to not let his past decide his future, he shook those thoughts and spoke. I see, well it is nice to meet you, my name is General Issei Haidu of the 501st Legion, and can you tell me more about yourselves? Both the girls nodded as Kaneko spoke with a tone of greeting. I will start with mine, General, my name is Kaneko Taoju, I am a captain in the Arcadian army, and I hail from the Kingdom of Faunus, in the Arcadian lands. I prefer using heavy weaponry and the nuke elemental magic to gain an upper hand against my enemies, as well as known to go a bit overboard, Kaneko explained herself, as Issei asked. I know this might be personal, but where are your Faunus traits just asking? Issei spoke as Kaneko explained, I did not inherit them. I see very well, and is it alright if I know your family and culture history? Kaneko nodded as she spoke. I will, so as I mentioned I did not inherit Fronis traits like my older sister Kuroka does, who serves as one of the many officers to the king of the Fronis kingdoms, Simba. 
and we hail from the kingdom of Faunus, where the Faunus rule those lands, and before you ask, we have zero tolerance towards racism, that is why we allow all Arcadian citizens to come to our lands, only those from the four kingdoms aren't allowed, and you know the reason, right general? Issei nodded as he spoke. Yes I do, captain, the humans there may act racist towards you, and the Faunus, well the White Fang should answer that. Kaneko nodded, as she spoke, precisely. Very well then, what about you Kiryu? Ake nodded as she spoke. Alright, my name is Aika Kiryu, I am a commander in the Arcadian army, and I live the life of a soldier in the Shadow Company. I also have a varied set of skills, both magical and physical, that can make me an excellent soldier, my skills include dark vision, premonition, bend time, devouring swarm to name a few. If I were to speak my skills, I would be sitting here all day. Issei noted this down, as he asked, is there any other important skill I need to know? Aika nodded as she spoke. I have shadow summons, which allow me to summon creatures of shadows to assist me, this was due to me being under one of the grim monarchs, the shadow monarch. Issei noted this as he understood she is a powerful member in Rhea's PMC, he knew that if the four kingdoms would go to war against them, they would be fifty shades of bucked. Invictus knew whom Aika was speaking about, and was happy that she was joining the 501st Legion as well. Very well then, I would be happy to have you join the 501st Legion as well. The girl smiled in response, before Issei's gaze turned serious as he spoke. Now, we are in a war that will decide the future of Arcadia, the gas attacks across the locations of Arcadia have been devastating to say the least, many Arcadians have perished, and several containment units have been working tirelessly to save as many Arcadians as possible even now as we speak. Those that have inhaled the most gas are the ones that have been suffering, and we need to defeat the Black Arms along with their allies as soon as possible. Even though we are winning, I have a feeling that soon enough, we will be in a situation that will take even more lives. Issei's words were agreed by everyone in the room present, they knew all too well what message Issei was trying to convey. The betrayal that Nicholas caused was staggering and ruthless, as many were deceived and fell for his charms, they thought him being from the Four Kingdoms were different. However, in reality, he showcased how far the people in the Four Kingdoms have fallen and become rotten. This did not mean that all are like that, but majority have become like that, and Nicholas's betrayal and the Ark Civil War will be the cause of one of the catastrophic aftermaths of any war. This was that no one will ever trust anyone that will be coming from the Four Kingdoms, especially the Ark family. We will be fighting in the core of the war, places where the Black Arms activity will be the highest, you all will be up for the most dangerous of skirmishes and missions, so what do you have to say, will you fight alongside me? Issei spoke with a serious tone, as Rias decided to speak for everyone in this room. Nicholas's betrayal has angered many Arcadians, his hands hold so much blood, innocent blood that no one can even imagine. He used his charms and manipulation to sow discord and deception into many of the officers and other military staff. The worst part is that he toyed with the Empress and the Ark clan, an unforgivable act in the eyes of all Arcadians. He even broke the Ark family, a family that cherished family bonds and love more than anything else, even more than any terror attack. Like you mentioned General, his terror attack was devastating, with many Arcadians falling to the Black Arms in their actions, even now we may not be in war as of yet, but we will soon have to, that is another reason I contacted the Empress. I also wish to fight in this war, and I wanted to fight alongside someone with whom I can trust with mine and my men's lives, that is why when you became the General, I wanted to fight under your command, General Issei Hyadurias declared seriously, as even Issei was taken aback by her words, never would he have witnessed the woman from his earth act so mature and capable. She knew what she was doing, and he couldn't help but be even more happy to accept her into the 501st Legion. I see and do you two agree to what your boss is saying? Both Kaneko and I cannot as they speak in unison, we do, General. Very well, in that case, we would be happy to have you and your PMC on board, Rias Gremory Rias nodded in understanding as she spoke with a smile. It would be an honor to work under you, General Issei nodded in acceptance, as his army will be getting stronger with the days coming by. Scene change. Dragon Kingdoms, 1 PM. Issei looked around at the magnificent kingdom of the dragons, this was not his first visit, but whenever he came, it marveled him to no bounds. It was a place where dragons could speak, think, roam, and have their own free will. I really love this place, don't you Drake? Drake responded with a tone full of agreement, indeed, but I would rather stay by your side, my best friend and partner. Just let me know when you want to get released, I am pretty sure Juniper, Aqua and Jade may find a way out of your sacred gear. Drake nodded in agreement, as he was not yet ready to leave Issei, and even if he does, he has made sure to let Issei use his abilities for fighting against any threat belonging to Arcadia. Anyways, you shouldn't keep office and Great Red waiting they also wished to lend a dragon that wanted to join the 501st Legion Issei nodded in understanding, as he soon walked ahead and greeted office and Great Red, the latter being in his dragonoid form, he was not yet interested in having a human form just yet. 
Hey guys, been a while office and Great Red also greeted him in return, as office immediately hugged him and spoke, Issei. Yes office, it's me Issei returned the hug towards office as Great Red spoke while walking towards him, it's good to see you in better spirits and completely recovered, looking back almost 3 years before, and looking now. It is nice to see you happier than ever. Yeah thanks Great Red Issei spoke as office soon split up as he asked. Speaking of which, where is the dragon that you talked about? Office nodded as she spoke. And before you ask, can you not judge him based on his appearance or voice? Issei sighed as he spoke. Let me guess, he is an Arcadian counterpart of one of the people that hated me back in my old world. The duo were surprised at first, but they soon remembered his encounter with Rias and Roswis of this world. They nodded as Great Red spoke. Yes, Hatchling, yes he is. And he wanted to join you without hesitation. He has been asking us ever since the Civil War had began and the declaration that the traitor had sent. Office responded with a growl, as Issei nodded in understanding. Very well, send him in. Office nodded as she called out to the dragon that he wanted to talk about, soon enough a magic circle revealed to be a blonde-haired man with blue eyes and a military outfit, he did not wear his armor as of yet. Since he was not on guard duty. This was Yudo Kiba, a pure-blooded dragon hailing from the Kingdom of Dragons. Hatchling, meet Yudo Kiba, a full-blooded dragon. He can turn into a dragon that can shoot out beams of yellow light as the element he was born from is light, he is the elite guard in the dragon kingdom, Yudo walked forward and spoke with a serious tone. So we finally get to meet in person, Red Dragon Emperor, or should I go by your military title General Issei shook his head and spoke. No, neither, just Issei would do, since we are not in the army. I never thought you were a dragon would you show me your dragon form? If you don't mind that is. Yudo nodded with a serious tone, as he responded, as you wish. Yudo glowed in a bright light as soon enough a giant dragon was in front of them, it seemed to be a western dragon that seemed to have a beard, which was wide in color and huge wingspans. It also had a giant tail like many other dragons. What do you think? Issei Issei nodded as he spoke, more than enough, you can return back now. Yudo did so, returning to his human form. Issei soon asked, so why do you want to join us? I wanted to assist the Empress, but I couldn't leave the guard of my kingdom just yet, unless I am part of a battalion, that is why I wanted to join you, so that I can protect the kingdom I was born and raised in, so would you please, accept me in the 501st Legion Yudo responded respectfully, as he looked at Great Red and Office, who both nodded as he knew that he was trusted by them, he then spoke, very well, I will let you know when our first battle will begin, Yudo Kiba. Kiba nodded as he spoke with a grateful bow. Thank you, Issei Issei nodded as he teleported away due to having some work with Juniper Arc, she was planning to teach him on how to pilot the Ragnarok which he had to learn sometime in the future. Kiba soon thanked Office and Great Red for helping him, as he also teleported back as well. So Baka Red, what do you think? Great Red responded with a smile. I saw his eyes, he has hope in them, and happiness as well, the Empress, I don't know how to say this has helped the Hatchling a lot, she helped him just like he helps her, and without her, Hatchling would have never been the same. I know Afa spoke with a smile, as Great Red suggested, you should probably tell him your feelings. I will Baka Red, I will soon enough Great Red took one look at her body and responded, although, I would suggest you to change your appearance to a more mature lady instead of a little child, you would have a better success rate. Office nodded in agreement as she decided to change her appearance completely, however she had to think on what she had to change on, and the next time she and Issei meet, she surely would definitely surprise Issei. Seen change, Arcadian space, 4.30 pm, two ships were seen piloting around the Arcadian outer space, these were the Imperial Plasma Starfighter and the Ragnarok, as Juniper was guiding him into the outer space. Juniper piloted the Imperial Plasma Starfighter, while Issei piloted the Ragnarok. All right Ice, whenever you pilot, just think of it as driving an aeroplane, you can pull the steering upwards to move the ship towards the north. Follow my lead. Juniper did so as she pulled the lever and her starfighter was in the air, Issei did so and was also following her as she spoke. A job now pushed the steering towards the left, Juniper spoke from the communications as Issei did so, she then spoke, now do the same, instead do it with the right as well. Alright Issei did so again, as he followed her perfectly, Juniper then spoke, excellent job, see you are getting the hang of this. Now do what you did and instead push the steering to the south, Issei nodded in agreement as he did so, before that Juniper taught him how to take off and land, using two buttons that generated thrust and allowed the ship to fly in the air and the other slowing down the ship for it to land successfully. Juniper noted that Ragnarok had more stable controls and it was slightly easier as opposed to a ship of such a caliber, but she knew that Issei can only master the ship if he practices on a daily basis. 
The job is say, now keep practicing the controls until I ask you to stop, alright Issei gave the confirmation as he responded, very well, Empress. Juniper gave a smile, as she watched Issei control the ship, it was shaky at first, but he was getting the hang of it, she knew that with practice, Issei would become one of the best starfighter pilots of all time. Chapter 21. Evil Rising. A few weeks later, Issei's office, Arcadian Military Base, 9.30 am. Issei was working in his office, he was working on his paperwork, checking on battalions and troopers that were present in the 501st Legion. He had several divisions in the 501st Legion, which comprised of Rhea's PMC, Ingvold's Battalion, Darkness Battalion, Grim Squad to name a few. Sighing, he looked at the amount of paperwork that he had to complete, he knew that it was going to take him the whole day to do so. He never knew that the general of the army would have this much paperwork he needed to complete. Paperwork is a bitch, that is what many would be saying. He pondered on what his battalion would be doing right now, they most likely would be training, or they would also be having work like he does. He finished signing the last of his paperwork, since he can do the rest after a small break, he knew that the war is slowing down a bit, but was still prevalent, Nicholas, Vlad and many others were becoming even more problematic, and the usage of Metal Gear Rays and their models variations were killing many of the troops in the war. However the Arcadians were fighting back, especially against Liquid Ocelot and his forces. Another problem that had taken place was the Settlement Defense Force being even more aggressive in their assault taking down several Arcadian space stations, however a counterforce by both the Arcadian space forces and the Unsaw's combined assault forced them back and even managed to make Salen Koch escape, however he would be hunted down and soon be eliminated. Alright that's done Issei spoke while stretching his arms, he knew what was going to happen, he looked at the piles of paperwork he had to complete. Although, the deadline was pretty far away, he preferred finishing it before it was too late, since he could easily relax after that and work on his god keys, he is planning to do only three more till he officially completes the project. However, just as he was about to rest, suddenly someone knocked on the door. He looked at the person and spoke, come in. The person who knocked on the door was revealed to be a young male draft with long neck length hair and blue eyes, he's eight feet tall with a large amount of muscle mass. His horns aren't large, he wore standard military uniform that comprised of a vest and track pants, he additionally wore black gloves as well. Captain Elias Greystone, what brings you here? Issei asks with a tone of surprise to which the now identified Elias speaks, the Supreme General Jean wishes to see you, she has just found some information about the black arms and what their next target is going to be. What? So what are they going to do? Elias speaks with a neutral tone, the Supreme General refuses to tell due to spies being in the army, and she has asked you to be personally present, along with your top trusted subordinates. Issei nodded an understanding as he responded seriously, let's go I will contact them right away. Can you inform her that we will be reaching her location in 15-20 minutes? Will do, Sir Elias responded with a cheerful tone as Issei immediately started to contact his most trusted subordinates and ask them to meet him as soon as possible. He also told them about the black arms, and almost everyone agreed to do so. Jean's office, 12.30 am. Issei came inside the meeting room where he was greeted by Bianca and Jean, as Jean spoke, General Haidu, I am glad you could make it. Issei nodded as he spoke. Indeed, my most trusted will be arriving soon, enough so is there anyone else that would be joining us. Bianca nodded in response as she spoke, my brother, Captain John would be joining alongside his subordinates. He should be arriving any moment now so we will be waiting. Jean spoke to which Issei nodded as he soon settled down. He then asked, so what are we up against? Any gist? Jean looked at Issei and spoke, I think you are familiar with the Umbrella Corporation, right? The Edge Aid did talk about it once, she did inform me that it was an organization that specialized in viruses and was known to cause mass destruction, a counter-organization was formed known as Neo Umbrella to prevent a repeat of that from ever happening, Issei spoke his own thoughts as Bianca added. Yes, General, you are right on that one, Jade along with Albert Wesker Ark, worked on to prevent history from repeating itself however the Black Arms were recently found to be working again in the corporation we will get into details when everyone is here, since it would make it easier. Issei nodded in understanding as they waited for the rest to come. Moments later, Issei's top trusted came inside, which comprised of Invictus, Yudo, Rias and her shadow company, Ingvold, Elias and Nix came inside. You called for us General. Rhea spoke seriously to which Issei nodded as she soon noticed both Bianca and Jean present, they all understood that it is very important, since two generals and the supreme general is present as well. After some more time, John and Violet came inside along with his original 15, which comprised of Murata Himeko, Lily Ironblooded, Kafka, Bladilina Milizer Lina, Kevin Kozlana, Bianca Adegina, Tallulah, Chen, Hashiguma, Branyas Achik, Ferlin Church, M.G. Atami and Hizura Minakata. Emeko is a young woman with a fair complexion, waist-length wavy red hair partially tied into a bun with golden rose ornaments and golden eyes. 
she wears a white sleeveless doga gown dress with a sweetheart neckline and straps that wrap around her neck. The dress is lined with red, embellished with golden laurels around her waist, and has a high slit along the right side that exposes her legs. She also wears a black coat on her right arm with white ruffles coming out of the sleeves. The coat is lined with gold and has various gold and rose decorations. Himeko wears multiple accessories, including a black choker with a golden rose, a golden earring in her right ear, black and gold bracelets on her left wrist, and a short black glove on her right hand. She also wears a black miniskirt with dangling black flowers, black heels, and carries a long black briefcase which houses her weapon. Lily Ironblooded was described to a tall and beautiful woman, who is also muscular. She has long dark brown hair and bright blue eyes with a small mischievous glint in them. Afka is described as being very beautiful and charming a young woman with red wine-colored hair that she ties in a messy ponytail, with two loose bangs hanging on either side of her face. Her eyes are of a similar, lighter color, and she wears dark pince-nez sunglasses on top of her head, along with a pearl earring in her right ear. She wears a white dress shirt that exposes the top of her back and shoulders, along with a black jacket that is draped over her shoulders. There's a silver butterfly pin on its left lapel, and on the back there is a large, spider-like pattern in the center, along with webs on both shoulders and a burgundy inside. There are also wine-colored straps with golden accents on both her jacket and thighs, and gloves of a similar shade. She wears black high-waisted shorts and nylon tights, with a thigh garter on her right leg. She also wears black boots with two different lengths. The right goes over her knee, while the left goes slightly over her ankle. Lena was a woman with silver eyes and hair. She is 160 centimeters tall, although she appears taller due to her heels. One of her more distinguishing features is her double ahogue. She is known to wear a formal military uniform due to her family's reputation in the military. This was Vladilina Milais, shortened for Lena. Heaven Kazlana is a tall man with fair skin and a stern expression. His eyes are blue like aquamarine gems, and his hair is as white as snow. Kevin wears a long black coat over his white turtleneck, with black pants and boots. There are splashes of blue here and there on his outfit. Bianca Durandal Adagina has a fair complexion, light blue eyes, and strawberry blonde hair that fades into a light pink at the ends. She often wears her hair down. Wears a tight black coat with streaks of teal and a short cape, a black military hat, brown leggings, and a pair of dark boots. The Lula was a pale-skinned tall woman with short gray hair and what appears to be spiky horns on her head, she has gray eyes and is often seen to be dressed in a formal military attire like Lena. Dan was a light-skinned woman with dark blue hair that's tied into a ponytail, she also has dragon horns on her head and red eyes. She also has a tail. Ashiguma is a tall woman with bright long green hair that is tied into a ponytail and has yellow eyes. She also has a one horn on the right side of her head. Branya is a young woman with long gray hair and matching gray eyes. She wears a short white dress with blue and gold details, two purple and blue earrings, thigh-high black boots, and translucent gloves. She has a blue and black hair tie and wears a golden symbol on her left breast that has the appearance of a mask. Berlin Church is a young man with light gray eyes and ash blonde hair. His hair was short with shaggy layers and bangs which hung over his forehead, between his eyes. The Tommy is a slender tall man with short messy black hair and brown eyes. And finally Hazuru is a young, attractive, and well-endowed woman sporting a nicely developed and pronounced feminine body, including a bust that John thinks is an H cup, though Hazuru insists that it's a G cup. She has long black hair and violet eyes. Issei had recognized all of them due to his frequent meetings with the 1-5 or the original 15. He immediately greeted them and introduced his most trusted to the members of the original 15. Once the greeting was done, Bianca then spoke garnering everyone's attention. Alright 500 first, original 15 may I have your attention everyone looked at her and spoke, let's get to the real plan. Bianca spoke seriously as they all looked at her, Bianca activates the scroll tab, revealing a well familiar city to those of the Arcadian origin, as John asks, Bakun City? John responds as Bianca speaks, yes captain, this is where your next mission will be, your mission will be to head there and locate her. Bianca spoke to which Jean responded, Raccoon City is a small, industrialized city located in Arcadia, an isolated mountain county in the Midwestern. It was during the outbreak of a virus that happened quite recently that has caused many of the civilians living there to turn into this. Jean shows them an image, as many paled looking at what happened here, this was what had happened to one of the cities that was recently developed and set up. Soon their paleness turned to fury, knowing how many innocents had befallen to the black arms, as Elias mutters. Iram Jean then continues to explain, those beings are zombies, accidental creations of the virus that has been infecting this place many have fallen to this virus, and your goal will be simple. Obtain the samples of the virus that the black arms are using, and make sure to save and locate any survivors, we have to find a cure to the virus the black arms are using as soon as possible. Jean explained the situation, as Bianca then continued, 
The one responsible for this is her Bianca brings out an image that surprised many, he was described to be a tall and beautiful woman with curly orange hair, she had blue eyes and is known to have an emotionless expression, similar to office. She is wearing a white polo underneath a black dress with golden linings, she is also wearing a corset with golden buckles, one of them has a jewel placed on it. She wears black gloves and a small cape with the middle also having a blue jewel. The woman you see on screen is Carmilla Leichtenberg, our spies have seen her operations in the city, and she has been acting more in this place than usual. Jean explained with a growl, as she then continues. Turns out, she has been operating in the city for months and hiding. Using Atlas Tech and funding courtesy of Nicholas, she has been able to develop her own strain of the T-virus and has released it onto the public. Jean explained the situation, as many especially John and Bianca growled, knowing that their traitorous father was responsible for so much death and destruction. Do you wish for us to capture her? Issei asked to which Jean responded, if possible, yes general. But your main goal is to get the virus supplies from her, but you need to make sure to not alert her in any way. Jean spoke seriously as John asked, so it is stealth and Bianca nodded as she spoke, yes captain. Additionally, you also will have to make sure to deal with any bows that you come across, especially those created by the black arms. The members nodded in agreement as Jean spoke with a serious tone. This operation will be led by General Haidu and Captain Ark, you must make sure to succeed in this operation and you cannot fail in any way. The two mentioned nodded in understanding as they all left the room, making the plans needed to head to the location and capture Carmilla. Scene change, briefing room, 2 p.m., Issei and John decided to make the plans needed for them in order to get the samples of the virus as Issei spoke. All right everyone, the map of the raccoon city shows that the lab is located in the heart of the city, that is where we find the samples and rescue as many people as we can, Issei spoke as he continued to explain. First we need to avoid using magic, our best option will be to take Carmilla by surprise, we will have to use stealth to our advantage, and we need to eliminate as much attention as we can get. Secondly, our goal will be to split up in two, first group will eliminate the zombies and save as many civilians as we can, the second group will be to head to the lab to directly confront Carmilla and whatever she has planned for us. The others nodded in agreement, as John soon added, the original 15 will be with me, we will all handle the rescue of others, most of you will be handling the zombies and rescuing any and all survivors. The original 15 nodded in understanding as Lily asked, but what if those survivors are infected? Issei understood this and spoke, then we shut down their nervous system, that way we can immobilize them and prevent any of their movement. Since we can relate zombie viruses to rabies or mad cow disease, that way we know that they will have a window of opportunity to make sure that they can be treated before they are turned. Lily nodded in understanding, as Murata asked, and what of these bows, who will handle them? I and my team will take care of them, I will be going with Rias, Ingvold, Ika and Kaneko, as well as Nix and Invictus as our backup, we will handle Carmilla and whatever she throws at us. Murata nodded as he soon turned to John and asked, John, contact your sister Jade and try to get some antiretroviral drugs for the T-virus and the G-virus that she would have developed, Violet assist him in doing so. That way we can at least buy some more time in case there are any infected amongst the survivors, John nodded as he spoke, as you wish General. The two soon left to do just that, as he looked to the rest and responded, the rest of you, we will be leaving soon enough in three hours, more details of the plan will be explained as we proceed towards Raccoon City, the less attention and detection we get, the more our chance of success will be. The others nodded in understanding as almost everyone left the place, minus Nix and Invictus, once they were gone. Issei took a deep breath showing his nervous eyed, this was his first proper war as a general, as Invictus asked with concern. Are you alright? Issei nodded after taking a breather. Yeah Buck, never knew being a general of the army had a lot of responsibilities, first I need to take care of my troops and have to make sure as many survive as possible. Nix nodded as she spoke, it's just how it is, Ice I believe you will be able to become a good general, you remember that you had to make strategies before. Issei nodded as he spoke, yay, but even then, this is the first time I am doing it against a situation like this I just hope I am good enough for this. Issei spoke with a sad tone, as Invictus decided to cheer his friend up. You did a good job Issei, the way you were able to prepare for precautions and backup plans, showed that you had proper experience, now all we need to do is prepare for the final plan of action, when we are entering Raccoon City, Issei nodded in understanding as he spoke, yeah, I guess we all should get ready, we only have 3 hours to prepare and succeed against a zombie infested city and, a madwoman who released one of the most deadly viruses into the public. Nix and Invictus nodded in agreement, as they also left soon enough, to prepare for what is coming next. They had to make sure that they are ready against whatever comes next. Chapter 22. Raccoon City. Willow was seated next to Issei, she was here to inform him about Carmilla Leichenberg, when Issei mentioned her name, Willow became extremely worried, knowing what kind of a monster Issei is going to face. 
she decided to reveal everything to Issei, as she was present alongside Juniper telling him more about Carmilla. Issei, the woman you are facing in this battle, she is considered the most dangerous criminal in all of Arcadia. Willow spoke seriously, however worry was laced in her voice. She was worried for her student, as Willow spoke, be careful, she has the means and the intelligence to break anyone, you included, she knows of your past, and you must be very careful, do not let her break you, alright. I won't, Willow sensei. Willow gave a smile, as Issei spoke, but I am going to need more information about her, is it alright for you to tell me? Willow was about to speak, as it was best if Issei went out prepared. I will explain Willow. Juniper spoke as she walked ahead, she then spoke with a serious tone, Issei, Carmilla is highly intelligent and is known to have the highest IQ in all of Arcadia to the point it's scary. She is the one who comes up with various plans to win every battle and even has backups to her backups. So when facing her, be prepared for anything. Issei nodded in understanding as Juniper continued, she was once a scientist who used any methods to achieve her little projects in the name of science. The kinds of experiments she does is inhumane and can cause problems with Arcadia. She will kill an entire city, all for the sake of science. The Red Dragon Emperor was horrified at this, even Euclid was not this bad, as Willow spoke with a sad tone, not to mention, she is why I became Sephiroth. Issei heard of Sephiroth from Willow, knowing that it was her that was the one responsible for it, he clenched his fists in anger, knowing the matter was extremely serious. He then spoke, I will succeed in this mission you can count on it. I know, but be careful, and please protect yourself, your squad as well as John and his squad, they are under your leadership. Issei nodded as he spoke, I will, my troops are under my protection, nothing will happen to them. Issei spoke seriously as Juniper spoke with a sigh, this mission needs to be successful, Carmilla's virus must not be released into the Arcadian public and must be contained, stopping her is something that must be done at all costs. Issei nodded in response as he got a call from Rias. Yes Major. Issei spoke as he responded, I am on my way. Issei cuts the call and speaks, I will take my leave, okay. Juniper and Willow nodded as they watched Issei leave, the Empress sighed as things have been getting better as she spoke, so how are things at your end Willow? With your husband. Willow gave a groan as she spoke, do you have to mention about shock? Please, that man can never be my husband. I know I guess we both are married in loveless marriages. Juniper spoke as the two women sighed knowing that they both are stuck in loveless marriages. Willow then spoke, well at least yours ended, I still have to deal with that greedy moron back home, I wish he were here. At the very least, I can have a good time before I do eventually end up going back there. Juniper chuckled in response as she responded, now I wish I had someone like him, just like you did, Willow looked at her friend and looked at her sadly, she could still see after images of betrayal in her heart, even she like many others, presumed her life with the emperor was set, a perfect loving marriage, however that was far from the truth. Now her broken state is still present, but is slightly better, Willow had a gut feeling that Nicholas would turn against her, given his frequent absences, coupled with Issei's vision made her certain that he would do that, but she did not want to believe someone so nice would turn against her like this. But he tragically did, and never even loved Juniper at all, she hated what happened to her, and despised Nicholas for breaking the Empress. Arcadian Briefing Center, Arcadia, 7.30pm, Issei and John along with their troopers were waiting for someone that would arrive. He was one of the main operatives and leaders of the BSSA, which means Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance. Soon enough he arrived, he was an older looking man entered the room. He has short brown hair and blue eyes, wearing a black long sleeved shirt and pants, armed with a bulletproof vest. He is Chris Redfield. Alright everyone, listen up. We got an alert level 5 in one of the major cities of Arcadia, known as Raccoon City, and command has tasked numerous units to deal with this problem. The only thing is, we lost nearly 85% of the first and second wave, meaning everyone here is the third wave. Chris looked to see many murmurs and whispers amongst the group, he looked towards Issei, as he knew he was the youngest man to become a general, and his promotion was also unique. He also remembered that he was the god key creator, which were only known by a select few, not everyone knows about them. As for Issei and John, they having a faint idea on what this is about. After all, Jade told them about a raid in the vault in the academy. They believes the black arms made their move in this type of warfare. For those of you who are questioning what's going on down there. I let the footage speak for itself. Chris spoke as he went over to the console and began setting up the video footage. Multiple screens now popping up around the projector. Scene change. Recording. The holographic screen starts playing footage of what appears to be someone hiding by the vents as they crawl forward towards an opening, the footage then zooms in inside the vault, now showing that of Carmilla walking inside, pressing a few buttons on the console and placing her hand on it as the console scans it and the voice of Carmilla's personal AI, Casville, can be heard talking to her. Welcome Lady Carmilla. To what do I owe the pleasure? Casville asked to which Carmilla responded. 
load up every sample we have in the vault, the Arcadians will be coming here soon, and I want these samples on my hands only. From there, the vault opens up as the samples rise up from a platform, a large pillar is shown where all the samples are being held, each of them labeled in their specific viruses or mutations. Carmilla brings out a large briefcase and opens it up, revealing many panels where she can place the samples, which are all in vials. All of them in different colors to differentiate themselves from one another. Carmilla places the vials at a quick pace as the operative watching her in the vents contacts their squad, informing them they have confirmation on the samples. We have confirmation. I have eyes on the virus samples. She's loading it up in the briefcase, we need to make our move now. One of the members speaks. The voice of a woman is heard in the comms. Copy, we're going in. Footsteps can be heard as the operative by the vent sees six operatives wearing black military wear, helmets, and gas masks, each of them having a different color in their visors. These are the soldiers of Wesker Squadron. The operative by the vents whips out a detonator and presses it, as they breach through the vents as they aim their assault rifle at Carmilla, with the rest doing the same. The leader of Wesker Squadron, Citri Einser of Wesker 1, yells out to Carmilla. Citri was described to be a beautiful woman, who looks very young for her age, she has long green hair tied to a bun to fit her helmet, and has bright green eyes. Carmilla, drop the samples and get down on your knees any wrong step, and we gun you down, Citri's voice was supported by another of the Wesker squadron, she is Rebecca Leah Revi, or Wesker 4. She was described to be a slightly tan-skinned woman who appears to be in her mid to late twenties. She has upper back length burgundy hair that she typically keeps in a low loose ponytail, including rather large bangs falling onto her forehead on either side, along with two shoulder length side locks framing her face. Moreover, she has amber brown eyes. All that Carmilla could do was laugh, as she closes the briefcase, stares at the pillar which still has half of the samples in it, and stood up from her position. I'm impressed, the famed Wesker squadron was able to get the jump on me. I really did not expect the Arcadians to actually enter my labs, and my men didn't inform me one bit as expected of my creations. One of the members of Wesker squadron angrily yells at Carmilla in response, she is in Comitary or Wesker 3. She was described to be a beautiful woman with a serious expression, described to have long dark green hair tied to a ponytail, a fringe by the middle of her forehead, and green eyes. We are not your creations Carmilla responds with a mocking tone, really now. Here I thought you all chose to be my creations. Citri and Shiho were getting very impatient by this. They wished to rip her throat off, but the Empress wanted her alive. Shiho or Wesker too was a severe looking woman with long dark brown hair and dark brown eyes, enough of this. If you don't follow our command in the next 10 seconds, we will have no choice but to use lethal force. Citri retorted to which Carmilla responded, I am pretty sure that our dear Empress wants me back alive, right? Oh, she does. But she didn't specify how to bring you back. Inko looks over to two operators of Wesker Squadron, her sister, Maya Midoriya, and Chitaran Amidam, gesturing them to move forward, as all of Wesker Squad slowly approaches Carmilla, with their guns trained on her head. Maya Wesker 5 was described to be a woman with short green hair and black eyes, giving off a cold distant impression of someone who doesn't have a strong sense of self. Balchitara Wesker 6 was described to be a woman that has short red hair, swept back from her face, and red eyes. She has fair skin and is one of the tallest members in the squad. Citri then speaks angrily, last warning, either come with us, or you will be in a body bag. Carmilla only responds, you may have caught me, but I always have plans when it comes to situations such as this. Citri realizes this and has a look of shock, knowing what's about to come as she pushes Seiko Busajima to the floor, seeing something lunging towards her. Seiko or Wesker 7 was described to be a woman that has straight and shiny thigh-length purple hair that has a triangular fringe at the front, which barely touches the ridge of her nose, blue eyes, and is quite tall. Everyone, get down Citri shouts as they all ducked. Something jumps on top of them and try to claw their heads off. Citri and Seiko look forward, seeing a bunch of reptilian-like creatures that are a few feet tall or almost the same height of a human, and are armed with large claws on their fingers. These are Hunter Superscript 2. Hunter Citri shouted, as let out a screeching roar and lunges towards Wesker Squadron as they fire their guns, taking a few of them out with Shiho and Inko delivering kicks that sent the hunters flying and crashing to the wall. And that's not the only thing you would have to deal with. Carmilla spoke with a smirks, as a booming sound can be heard as the ceiling breaks into pieces, creating a giant hole as something lands on the vault. From what they can see it's a humanoid monstrous creature that has two large arms connected to its back, all four arms are armed with claws on their fingers, with a large eyeball on its right arm. Its face is white with red eyes and sharp teeth that can be seen by all. This is a variant of the G. Birkin in which Carmilla recreated and manufactured for the black arms. The G. Birkin variant roars and charges at Wesker Squadron, Carmilla is now holding the briefcase and looks at the pillar that still has the samples. She looks at her former creations knowing it was risky to stay here. 
since she had to secure the samples or at least half of them that were still back. She looks at the Wesker squadron fighting the G-Birkin variant and decides to leave. I believe it is time I take my leave. Carmilla spoke looking at the vault. She opens up a hatch by the vault and makes her exit, all the while the sounds of bullets can still be heard as Wesker squadron continues to engage the bows. Recording ends. Scene change, seeing the situation. I believe you all know what's happened. Chris asked to which John spoke, yes, it seems the Black Arms decided to initiate their plan on biological warfare, choosing the very city where bioweapon started, and now, it's happening all over again. Indeed, the same events that happened decades ago are happening now, and that's why we're here to stop it. The holographic projector now shows the entire map of Raccoon City, which is now bigger than what it was before. But in the holomap, we can see numerous areas are covered in red, with only some that are in blue. Alright, everyone. Here's the rundown. Numerous key points around the city are at a level 5 quarantine zone, we are working with Neo Umbrella to seal the more hazardous zones and prevent the gas from getting even further around the city, and yes, the Black Arms deployed missiles and bombs that are armed with a sea virus, causing many parts of the city to be overrun in a matter of minutes. Chris explained as he continued with the hologram now showing where majority of the gas hit, seeing it was 25% of the city, with the G virus hitting 75% of it. Neo Umbrella units and BSSA operatives have confirmed numerous bows have been deployed all over the city, making it difficult for us to rescue civilians that are in the evacuation zones. That is why we'll send in battalions to deal with them. He changes the hologram to blue zones in the city. These are the areas we were able to set up, this is the main zone where any civilians that survived the initial outbreak can go. It is heavily defended and we implemented a force field to protect the zone, if the Black Arms plan to shoot out a rocket, we also planted detectors and scanners to see if someone has been bitten. Chris explained as Issei asked. Are we using the antiretroviral drugs, vaccines and sprays we made to cure the bite off? Issei's plan was to make sure the survivors are rescued, while only the dead were meant to be killed. Even the original 15 and the 501st along with the battalion soldiers were concerned, their first plan involved saving those that they could. He presumed that the virus would be similar to any disease that would slow or prevent the virus from doing serious damage or worse from spreading. However, what Issei found was a solemn look from Chris, he already tried what Issei suggested surprised by someone so young, so capable, but alas thanks to the black arms, there was nothing they could do. We did general, but it turns out Carmilla negated the effects of the vaccine, preventing any of the civilians that were bitten to be cured, and sadly, it has come down to this decision. All citizens at this moment are to be terminated with extreme prejudice, until we find a vaccine that can cure them back, we have full authorization to take them out. Chris spoke with a grim tone making the whole room silent, many were clenching their fusts with anger and frustration. John and Issei were gritting their teeth in fury, knowing it was Nicholas or Vlad that asked Carmilla to do so. Moving on, while the rest of the main force deals with the horde, I will assign two teams to handle these objective points. Chris explained as the hologram now changes to a building with a communications tower, the others are a mansion and an underground lab. First off, I want the 1-5 to send a squad to deal with the communications tower, the black arms found a way to jam our comms, we need the tower gone ASAP. After that, take your unit to the Arclay mansion and secure what remains of the samples since we have a report Carmilla left the half in the vault, members of Wesker squad will assist you in this mission. John nodded in understanding, as John responded. Understood. Chris turned to Issei and spoke, General, take your team and Shadow Company to that location, raid the underground lab of its intel, as well as capture Carmilla. Wesker squad reported she fled somewhere in the city, and we believe it's there. Copy that, are we going to take the tolls to head there? Chris shook his head and spoke, I'm afraid not, we can land you in the main zone, but outside of those borders is by vehicle or walking. The reason why we can't is because of this man. He presses a button as the holographic projector now shows an image of a man, he is described to be an older looking man with short grey hair, blue eyes, and a shaved beard. The logo of the UPCS is shown on his chest. This man here is Nikolai Zinoviev. We have numerous confirmed reports that Nikolai has people in the UBCS that work for the Black Arms, they were the very reason the outbreak erupted in Raccoon City, and we couldn't contain it until this point in time. They have squads posted in rooftops, armed with SAM sites, they already took out our reinforcements, and we can't risk any of our birds being shot down. Arcadian Command has given us the order to take out Nikolai and any or all UPCS on site. Chris spoke with a serious tone, as John sarcastically spoke, great, more traitors in Arcadia. Just what we needed right now. Many were getting annoyed due to how many joined the Black Arms, they were able to weed them out, but it was too late for some of them. Even so, with the amount of losses we suffered with the first and second wave, Arcadian Command has no choice but to not send relief and bomb the city, again. The people present were shocked and horrified by this, as Chris speaks seriously. 
That is why we must give it our all to stop this threat once and for all. Remember, we have limited time to do this, so make it count everyone the Arcadians nodded as Issei spoke. May I speak something? Chris looked at Issei, with everyone soon following suit, go ahead, General. I can work on a weaker teleportation circle, it won't be detectable, which will allow us to head directly to the locations undetectable although, it will take me some time to set them up, will that be alright? Chris thought for a moment as he spoke. That will be fine, General it can work, Chris contacted the Wesker squadron and the others informing the situation as Issei gets to work on the circles. The others including his own legion excluding Nix, knew what he was doing. General, how long will it take? Issei looked at Chris and spoke, 30-45 minutes max for development and 10-15 minutes max for testing, is that alright? Yes, that is fine, but try to complete it quicker. Issei nodded as he continued to focus and work on it. He was a capable mage after all, and was one of the strongest mages out there. Scene change, 2100 hours. Issei had set up the portals and checked it out as he spoke, yep, it's fine do you two want to take a look? Issei asked John and Chris who nodded as they checked the portals, they were at the blind spots, as John spoke, yeah this is fine. Issei gave a sigh of relief as Chris spoke, this makes our job easier, never thought magic could be used it in this way. Chris was surprised, only a very few in Arcadia have this high level of aptitude and even less are capable of properly using teleportation magic in such an impressive manner. And the Wesker squadron. Chris informed, they have already been engaging the bows we can use this as an opportunity to catch them off guard. Very well then guys, let's head out. The others nodded as the groups entered their respective portals. The Shadow Company followed suit, with most of them wearing their equipment for battle, along with the soldiers from Neo Umbrella. The teleportation circles brought them straight to their designated locations as they immediately to the locations. Rias and the rest of the Shadow Company have worn their outfits and have equipped with standard military-grade weaponry. Okay what's the plan General? Ingvald asked as Issei looked around the cameras and tried to generate a diagram as he spoke, cameras are located in many locations, meaning Carmilla will know immediately as soon as we show up there are a few ways we could do this we eliminate the guards and then head for the lab, get the samples and get our way out of here. I will disable and recreate the teleportation circle at the meta point where the rest of the squadron is. Riaz and the others nodded as Issei spoke. Fire at the cameras, on my signal, fire at the soldiers, the later Carmilla knows about us being here, the more time we can get to capture her. The others nodded, as Rias fired her blasters at the cameras completely destroying them. This alerted the soldiers, they were Blackwatch soldiers, these soldiers are tasked with doing field work or Carmilla's dirty work. When it comes to anything outside the bases of Carmilla's labs, one would see these guys often. They were present as security guards, as Issei shouted. Now Riaz and the Shadow Squadron nodded, as all of the 500 first started to fire their weapons at the unprepared soldiers, they were gunned down in mere moments. They were taken out immediately as Issei spoke seriously, we need to get a move on, follow me be prepared for anything, the teams nodded as they started to rush inside the rooms. Issei fired a dragon shot at the doors and headed inside. 2157. Carmilla was watching the video feed when suddenly one of the cameras were destroyed, what? Armil exclaimed with shock as she soon saw the original 15 and the 500 First Legion along with the Shadow Company had already infiltrated her lab and communication tower, taking down any soldiers and bows they came across. She gritted her teeth in frustration and anger as she growled in response, knowing who was responsible. Sekiruate Carmilla calmed down after a while, she knew getting angry was pointless and all the guards that she posted outside along with the bows were useless to her then. However, suddenly while she was watching something caught her eye, the Prince of Arcadia was all alone, and this could be an opportunity she could use to her advantage, while John is nowhere to save them or the best case scenario, hunt John down during this whole duration of the battle. Since the Shadow Company were nearby, she smirked remembering that she has been working on one of the angels that was captured and experimented from Issei's homeworld. The test subject that she had captured was the only one amongst the several angels that she had captured to have survived the experimentations that Carmilla put her through making her on par with the archangels in Arcadia. This was her very own magical mechanical angel that was equipped with magical abilities, capable of harming or damaging any race, even Issei was not immune. Asvel Carmilla spoke with a smile, as the AI had spoken, to what do I owe the pleasure of assisting you, Lady Carmilla. Initiate the Nemesis Protocol. Inside one of the vaults, it brought out a large container that seems to be housing something or someone inside of it. The container began to open as steam rises out on the opening of the door before it gets kicked, sending the door crashing outside the halls of the vault. There, some large creature that stands taller than anyone in the lab, whose appearance has some sort of heavy brown skin attached to its face, with its mouth having a large opening, seeing its sharp teeth, it wears black robes and has purple-like tentacles all around it. 
The Bo looks around and proceeds to yell something out. Star's nemesis roared as Carmilla watched with a smile. She soon heads to another location as she puts in a password to the louder to give the command to activate the one she had experimented on. Initiate the angel protocol. Casville nodded as the angel's whole body started to glow a bright blue in color. The being was described to be a mechanical being with black armor which had blue stripes. The wings had a glowy blue futuristic pattern as the visor and the angel glowed a jet blue in color. It held a giant sword in its hand. Let us see how you handle dot dot angel. Carmilla spoke as her two creations head towards their intended targets. 2215. Issei and the 500 first keep gunning down the opposing Black Watch soldiers which were getting even higher, they had just dealt with a bunch of lickers and tyrants, which were the bows that they had to deal with, most of them were dead behind them, along with scores of Black Watch soldiers. Lickers were grotesque creature that is made up of nothing but muscle, has sharp claws on its hands and feet, having an exposed brain, and has a long tongue sticking out of its mouth. All tyrants were creatures that is considered a human bioweapon, created through either a primary T-virus infection to create a weapon, or the cloning of such specimens, with the intent to be used as super soldiers on the battlefield. Issei kept firing onto the Blackwatch soldiers using the M4, which are the parts placed in it. Hightower 20 Barrel Sakin ZX Grip Choreo Precio Factory Schlager Packbox IV. This was a finish that was custom made by him and had a marshmallow charm that office had added once for good luck. Issei kept firing onto the squadron while reloading whenever he could. The Shadow Company troopers were also assisting him in giving cover fire whenever they needed to do so. There are more reinforcements arriving Ingvold shouted as she fired onto the soldiers as Issei acted quickly. Kaneko Kaneko turned towards him and Issei spoke, blow them up, of pleasure, General Kaneko grinned in response as she generated a small sphere of nuclear elemental energy. She soon flung it over towards the soldiers who all screamed in pain as a huge explosion took place. Issei generated a shield that protected his soldiers, Kaneko had a grin seeing them suffer. Issei gave a glance at her and couldn't help but have a bead of sweat from his face, if there was any doubt left in his mind that this was not the same Kaneko from his world. Then that must have been cleared. He soon spoke. The job Kaneko gave a toothy grin, as Issei nodded, the dust settled down, as Issei and company head inside, only for them to have a run-in with more liquors. Issei, in response kept firing his M4 at the beasts, which they easily evaded with grace. Once they got close. Issei dropped his M4 and removed Excalibur swiftly decapitating one of them. He dashed towards the other assisting Rias and taking them out with swift swings. You okay? Rias gave a nod as they kept pushing on. They managed to further on with their advance, taking down any Blackwatch soldiers they could find. Additionally they were also the even stronger variant of the Blackwatch soldiers, these were more armored and even more cloaked and had blades in their left arms as well. These soldiers were even more deadlier than the previous ones. The soldiers started to aim their weapons and quickly fire at the 500 first as Issei commanded, take cover. Quickly acting upon it, Issei generated a force field which protected the rest of his legion. He soon spoke. I want you all to fire at the soldiers Rias then spoke, but the armor. I got that one covered once the shields are down, fire at them, Rias and the others reluctantly agreed as they did so. Issei activated the boosted gear and when the shields were down, due to them reloading, Rias and company fired at them, as the gear announced. Penetrate the bullets bypassed their bulletproof gear, and they were all gunned down in an instant, much to the surprise of the 500 first, as Ingvild asked. What just happened? Issei spoke, one of boosted gear's abilities, penetrate. It allows me to bypass any defense, magical or physical. It can also be used to penetrate through attacks and attack the core of opponents. The others nodded, as Issei commanded, let's get a move on, we are not that far off. The others nodded as they headed inside, only a few of the soldiers were wounded, as Issei commanded the medics to heal up the wounded, with some of them keeping watch. They almost reached the entrance of the laboratory where they could see that the door was sealed. They were suddenly ambushed by many more tyrants, as they all looked around. Fire at them. One of the soldiers of the 500 first charged at them as the tyrants kept blocking the ammo, as Nyx generated a magic shield. Elias assisted her by blocking one of the tyrants with his bare hands and saving some of the 500 first soldiers. Thank you Elias shook his head and spoke, no time to thank now dot dot we need to fight against them. Nix, can you create a darkness field? Elias exclaimed as the primordial goddess nodded, it would be taxing, but it is worth a short, it will be exhausting, but I will. Nix performed a darkness field as Elias used his rifle that he had 50 BMG, these rounds staggered the tyrants as Nix followed it up with several darkness attacks, with Invictus following suit as well. They all were dealing with the tyrants with Issei and the others assisting them in the fight as well. Issei, listen dot dot head inside and stop Carmilla, take the Shadow Company and Ingvold with you leave the rest outside to us, Nix spoke as Issei wanted to protest, as Invictus added. 
we will be fine, go on ahead stop her from taking the samples, and capture her Issei nodded, understanding how dire the situation is, as he looked at Ria's, Kaneko, Ika and Ingvald, who understood what they have to do. Very well, we will head inside, stay sharp and minimize casualties, as much as you can Elias, Invictus and Nyx nodded as Issei fired a dragon shot, and they all rushed inside the laboratory where Carmilla was looking at them with a smile. So we finally meet in person, Sekiruate Carmilla turned to Issei and the Shadow Company as they all ready their weapons, as the latter growled. Should've known it was you, Willow told me everything about you. Carmilla Lachenberg. Carmilla only laughed at his face, as she spoke mockingly, I see my creation must have told a lot of things about me, good things I presume. She was after all my greatest creation, I mean, there is a reason she is one of the strongest, if not the strongest of all of Arcadia. She is training you after all, from what Nicholas has informed me. He told me all about you, and your time in Arcadia. Carmilla spoke while walking around and speaking. I am impressed with your achievements, not only you have the intelligence, but also the magical prowess to even infiltrate here, your actions have made sure that you succeed no matter what happens, Carmilla spoke with a joyful tone, as she added. You and I, are not that different, hi do Issei Issei growled in response, Carmilla was really getting on his nerves, how so? You and I both crave for the unknown, create powerful things that would be beneficial. The powerful things like guns that can be as strong as the heat of the sun, and I, in my creations of the Wesker squadron and your mentor, Sephiroth. Issei glared at her with anger in his eyes, as he spoke. We are nothing alike, you have utter disregard for others, you will destroy cities for your own craving of knowledge. Willow told me on how you have no regard for anyone but yourself, that was why you were banished from Arcadia, weren't you Carmilla? Carmilla lost her smile and gave a sigh as she spoke, I see maybe you are right. Carmilla looked towards the samples and spoke, so you want this, right? Yeah. Rias growled as she motioned the shadow company to surround her, Carmilla could only look mockingly, she knew what she had to do, as Rhea spoke, I would advise you to hand over the samples, surrender and get on your knees dot dot unless you want to be gunned down. But, doesn't the Empress want me alive? Issei responded, of course she does, but never specified on how we need to bring you in. That is something the Wesker squadron also told but I am afraid I can't do that, Carmilla looked up as a bright light suddenly shone onto them, causing them to lose their sight for a moment. Carmilla used this moment to take the samples and escape. However, Issei was able to put immunity shields and immediately did the same for Ika as he spoke, Ika now. Regaining her vision, Ika nodded, she used her telekinesis to snatch the samples from Carmilla, much to her surprise, she tried to regain it back, only for Issei to respond with a dragon shot, causing her to create a magic barrier to defend herself, but it was strong enough to send her a bit behind. Ika gained the samples and gave it to Issei who stored them in a pocket dimension. Issei and Aika looked up and immediately acted upon this. They used their weapons to fire onto the angel, causing it to be distracted, as the light was disabled. This allowed Ria's and the others to recover, but Ria's was damaged even more, since the light used was holy, and it affected demonic beings like her. Issei and Aika rushed to her and spoke, you okay? Why yeah, I am fine Issei used a healing spell to get her healed up, as he could see visible frustration on Carmilla's face, as she commanded the angel. Angel wipe the shadow company and that shadow down, but capture the red dragon, I want him alive, the angel released its aura in response, as Issei became wide-eyed, recognizing the aura that was present in Angel. He knew the black arms knew about his past. And now. He found out how they came to know about his past. Chapter 23. Mechanical Angel. The angel was releasing immense aura into the field, making the five members of the 501st stagger in worry. Issei had his Excalibur in the ready and got into his stance. He glanced towards Ria's and thought, amongst our group, Ria's is the most vulnerable due to her demonic blood, when that thing uses holy light, I need to find a way to defeat that before it could do that its wings are a source, maybe I can disable that but I need to subdue it quickly. His thoughts were snapped when Carmilla announced. Angel, terminate these people, but I want the red dragon emperor alive, the angel's wings glowed as Carmilla looked towards Issei and Ingvald, and had her own thoughts. Dealing with him is something I need to make him pay for tormenting Nicholas. His beautiful face was destroyed by that dragon. He will pay for this. Carmilla looked towards Issei and internally grinned. I can bring him in, doesn't mean I have to bring him in one piece, Carmilla knew that the angel had dragon slaying light as well, which it did not reveal, as she decided to flee from the location watching from a safe distance. I could try to subdue her, but the angel tackled her to the ground. Issei and the others assisted her as the former went into his balance breaker state, they all were fighting against the angel, Issei blocked several attacks from the angel using the Excalibur, as it constantly unleashed several light spears on the team, which caused Issei to block his side of the light spears. Ingvold followed it up with her own lava elemental magic, as it started to burn down the light spears heading her way, as the others generated magic barriers. 
Riaz and Kaneko soon followed it up by unleashing several blaster shots towards the angel, which only grazed the armor, as Ingvold and Ika took their weapons as well. However the angel was unfazed, with the safe firing several dragon shots, which caused it to slice them in half, completely destroying them with ease. Arnid Issei exclaimed with frustration, as he looked at Riaz who nodded, the duo dropped their weapons as Riaz brought her gravity dust mace, which was made of vibranium, a special metal that was found in the Fronis Kingdom, all members of the Shadow Company had access to this metal. Using her strength, the duo charged at them, as Issei commanded while looking away, unleash support magic upon the angel, when I ask you to the three girls nodded, as Issei and Riaz dashed towards them with their weapons in their hands slash strike, both of them, attacked the angel at once, who blocked one with its blade which was the Excalibur, and while the angel blocked the attack much to Rhea's surprise, as the girls unleashed a barrage of magical attacks, comprising of elemental attacks such as fire, lightning, rock, lava and magma, as it caused a massive explosion, but when the dust settled, the angel was barely damaged, upon closer inspection, the armor was healing with ease, much to the 501st shock, as Carmilla spoke mockingly. Did you really think that my creations would falter so easily? Carmilla's words angered the 501st, especially Issei, as she commanded the angel. Unleash protocol, divine decimation the angel's body suddenly glowed with massive holy light. Riaz tried to escape, but the angel did not let go of her mace. Issei reacted quickly, getting Riaz out of there, as he carried her much to the girl's surprise, she did end up losing her mace though. The holy light was too strong, this would have seriously damaged her, as the angel unleashed a very strong holy explosion towards the team, as he brought her to a safe location. Quickly reacting, Issei created a very strong magic shield to protect them, as Ingvold assisted him to defend her team, as when the light died out. Everything returned to normal. You okay? Riaz nodded as Issei released her, upon closer inspection there was a small red tint on her face. This was the second time he was able to save her, otherwise she would have been damaged badly. However, that all changed when Carmilla spoke. It is time to take my leave nice talking to you, Issei. Carmilla spoke with a mocking tone as she fled, Issei tried to use gravity magic, but the angel threw several halos at Issei, forcing all of them to defend, giving Carmilla the window to escape. Issei gritted his teeth in frustration as Carmilla opened a secret hatch and managed to escape. He dashed towards the angel with the intention to defeat it at all costs. The angel unleashed a storm of light barrage needles at the group, as Riaz used her destructive magic to protect her and her team. It soon dashed ready to slice off Rhea's head, however Issei blocked it with his blade, Excalibur, he used Earth's stance to protect her team. Rhea's was able to maneuver around the field and get her mace back, which Carmilla failed to get. Ingvold followed it up it by unleashing a strong magic blast at the angel's behind staggering it for a moment. The angel soon flew up to the sky as it unleashed several daggers of light, however these were aimed at Issei, who blocked several of it. Unfortunately, one of them struck Issei's hand making him hiss in pain. Dragon Slayer Dragon used in response, be careful that woman Carmilla must have infused Dragon Slayer onto this being. Rias quickly followed it up by using destruction magic, she had to be careful to not destroy the laboratory, due to what existed in this laboratory. Carmilla would have some traps as well. The angel flew into the group as Issei blocked it with his Excalibur, as Kaneko flung some nuclear explosive magic towards the angel, as Issei jumped in the air, avoiding the explosion. You okay? Kaneko asked as Issei nodded, he soon saw the damage on the angel, as he could start to see the skin. The angel's visor was flickering, however it soon unleashed a storm of holy light, as Issei protected his team using a very strong magic barrier. While this was going on, Issei spoke to Aika. Aika, try using foresight and couple it with possession, see if we can find a weakness of this, angel Aika nodded and spoke with response, understood, general. Aika stopped time using foresight, with the exception of her team, she was able to hold it off for some time. She soon possessed Angel trying to get control, but it was resisting causing Aika to struggle. Issei then shouted. Both of Judah Issei summoned his tenth god key. It was a cross that had chains around it. He immediately encased onto the ground implanting it, this was the oath of Judah. He knew Aika won't be able to control Angel for much longer. Issei commanded several chains to restrain Angel, making it unable to fly or evade attacks with any power. He made sure to deal with any of the holy magic attacks headed her way, knowing he had to protect his squad, he commanded. Off power release elision pedian the room suddenly changed as the oath of Judah transformed into a dimension with several clockworks. The gears around the whole ab were turning which was completely restraining the angel like it was nothing. The angel felt a complete loss of power and mobility. Issei removed the oath of Judah from the ground, seeing the helpless angel on the ground trying to use any attack it could, he looked towards Riaz and spoke. It's time to end this, Riaz Riaz nodded as she stepped forward, she spoke to Issei, I will be using my most strongest attack this will defeat the angel how long will this dimension last? 
5 minutes till it starts to penalize me, Rias gave a smile that was more than enough for her to take her to defeat the angel. Her expression changes to that of anger, she starts to charge for a minute, as Issei could sense a massive amount of mana from Rias, he could also see her fists emit a vile green glow. Ingvold, barriers now Ingvold nodded as she generated a magic barrier of her own. Issei knew he would be fine due to the oath of Judah protecting him from any magic attack, he can create a ceiling barrier around him and the laboratory, and in case Ingvold's barrier breaks, even his team as well. Rias was done charging, as a minute has passed. Rhea's eyes shoot open, and her eyes are the same vile green as it is currently. Demon splash flare Rhea shouts as everything around the angel is obliterated, including the angel, as a green energy flare was sent towards her. Ingvold struggled to maintain the barrier, and it broke, due to Rhea's immense attack, however much to their surprise, neither was harmed as they noticed to say with a smile, he has got their back and will protect his team at all costs. They returned a smile of their own as well, with Ingvold having a small red tint. Once the dust settled Rias could be seen with an evil smirk, stating job well done. However Rias turned around to see the laboratory completely unharmed, she looked at the general, knowing this was his doing, she was terrified and surprised by how powerful the god Keoth of Judah was, it completely sealed any power that had come into contact with it. She was glad to say was on their side. She looked to see him disable the oath of Judah, she soon looked towards her team and exclaimed with worry, are you three okay? We are fine, thanks to the general setting up the sealing power of Oath of Judah, we were protected. She looks towards Issei and thanks him. I would like to thank you for protecting my shadow company. Issei nodded and spoke, you needn't worry, protecting my legion is what a general does. Rias returned a smile, as she then asks, so this is the power of the Oath of Judah. Yep Issei responded as he continued, this is what it is capable of it can seal any magic power, even effectively erasing it completely. That was what I used to prevent the attack from harming the lab or any of us. Yeah, I know sorry, I got carried away. Rhea spoke while rubbing her head, as soon, the electricity started to be heard causing everyone to turn to the angel. Only to see her whole body turning unstable. The armor was starting to break off, as the person was soon revealed itself. She was a beautiful young woman with a slender yet curvaceous physique, a big bust and regular height. She has very pale skin, large light blue eyes which can turn orange while gaining a triskel, and long silver hair reaching her waist, she wears a white dress with a purple cloth wound on her neck, a golden waist ornament. She wore white heels and golden leg ornaments as well. Issei recognized who she was and understood now how did Carmilla and the Black Arms came to know about his past, they must have extracted her memory. This was Elizabeth Lyons. No way Issei mused with surprise, as he remembered her to be from Gabriel's Brave Saints. Rias and the others looked at Issei's surprised expression, and Rias asked, You know her, General? Issei only looked at her and gave a nod, as he spoke, Yes, I do her name is Elizabeth Lyons, and my question is how did she come from my earth all the way here? The Black Arms could have captured her and used her for experimentation, Carmilla doing this is not a surprise. She was known to perform experimentation upon others. Ingvold responded as Issei shook his head and spoke, You may not be wrong, but my earth was undiscovered, that was until the Black Arms located them and found out about it just recently. It is not from any of the recorded earths Issei spoke with concern, as he wondered who else was involved. He feared on who from his earth may be involved. He had to warn Juniper and the other arcs about this. So what should we do? Ika asked to which Issei responded, We need to use something to imprison her, in case she goes berserk and attacks us due to Carmilla it is to make sure she does not try and harm any of us. She does not seem bitten by the zombies, so we can head back. We got the samples, turns to Ika you have them. Ika nodded as Issei spoke, keep it with you and hand it to the Wesker squadron once we leave from here. Very well Issei carried Elizabeth on her back, he was still in his armor, soon enough the doors opened up, revealing the rest of the 500 first comprising of Nyx, Invictus and Elias, along with a newly joined Inko Midoriya, who assisted them in taking down the bows, Issei then spoke, Midoriya. Inko nodded as she spoke, yes general I was able to get to your legion before many more could be killed, did you get the samples? Issei nodded as he motioned Ika to give the samples to Inko who looked at and spoke, yes, this seems to be fine. She soon turned her attention to Elizabeth as even the others did so. Nix was surprised to see who Issei was carrying. Inko then asked, is she? Issei gave a nod and spoke, yep, one of Carmilla's pet projects, she is alive but knocked out, we should take her back and speaking of the woman herself, she was able to escape using her as a distraction. Inko growled in response, she was able to escape yet again as she spoke, I see. But are you sure we should keep her, for all we know she could turn on us and even try to attack us. Issei nodded in understanding as he spoke, if he does I will take sole responsibility, but for now, we should restrain her in case she does attack. Inko nodded in understanding as she brought out the samples and kept it with her in a capsule that would protect them from harm. 
She took a glance towards Elizabeth, seeing her down body. She gritted her teeth, not surprised by what Carmilla had done. She pitied the girl that was used as a test subject for her experimentation. The group soon headed outside, as they could see piles of bodies which comprised of the bows and several other beams. Issei kept carrying Elizabeth on her shoulder. They made sure to not trigger any traps as they headed all the way back to the magic circle that was present at the start of the situation. They were ambushed by several G Birkin variants, who tried to attack the group. The group immediately brought out their guns and started firing onto them. The G Birkins were resilient as they tackled Kaneko away along with several other soldiers of the 501st, who was able to recover. Aika quickly responded by using Devouring Swarm onto the G Birkins, distracting it as they roared. Buried the G Birkins roared as they were distracted, Inko then quickly responded, Issei, use your flames to burn them down. Understood Issei responded, he gave Elizabeth to one of the 501st troopers, as he shouted, flame blaze. Issei inhaled the air surrounding him as he generates a small flame in his stomach. As two announcements were heard. Boost transfer Issei unleashed a strong flame towards the group of G Birkins, as he was able to incinerate all of them alive. They were all burned to the ground alive leaving no trace of them left. Inko and the 501st moved on ahead, as their next goal was to head back to the start of the base, where Issei will create the portal that will head them back. However, once they were at the lower levels, they were ambushed by several Javo zombies, who had tools in their hands. These zombies or bows were special due to them having multiple eyes. Are those Javos? Issei asked with horror, looking at them as Inko responded, yep, that is them, these creatures are not like regular zombies, they are far intelligent and far stronger. The Javos started to rush towards them, working in pack they were much more difficult, as Issei looked towards the 500 first, that started to open fire at them, except for the one that was holding an unconscious Elizabeth. Several of the Javos were killed, as Inko gave the capsule to Issei, and followed it with a roundhouse kick which decapitated the Javo head sending it flying, as she followed it up by firing multiple shots at the Javos, as Issei added his own ammunition to them. The Javos were falling apart like flies, as one of the soldiers asked, just how powerful are they? They are strong enough to communicate assaults and work together to kill the unaffected humans and even take them down. They are aggressive as the regular bows caused by the C-Virus, there were even stronger variants of the Javo, the good things is that none of them were here. Inko spoke making many of the 500 first soldiers shudder for a moment, the incidents prior terrified most of the Arcadian soldiers, as Issei responded looking at the Javos that were standing up once again. Look they are regenerating. The Javos that sustained some of the damage were reviving as Issei looked to the Legion and spoke. Does anyone have a grenade? Issei asked to which Kaneko spoke. I do. Give it to me. Kaneko nodded as he used the boosted gear as it announced. Boost boost transfer. Issei enhanced the explosive power of the boosted gear and spoke. Once I throw this grenade, everyone sprint towards the rendezvous point. Immediately they all nodded in response as Issei opened the pin and they all rushed on ahead. Issei was the last to leave, he helped the soldiers that were wounded, he took Elizabeth with him from the soldier who ran towards the point. They only had a few seconds before the grenade exploded, as it completely destroyed the location along with the Javos. Some of the soldiers fell to the ground due to the explosion. Issei generated a barrier to protect his legion from any damage. Once the situation was much calmer, Issei deactivated the barrier and spoke, let's all head back. The others nodded as they walked ahead, many of the soldiers were ready for an ambush, as predicted they heard some more growling as Nick spoke with annoyance. Not more of these zombies. Nick's readied her gun, she was low on magic, due to facing the tyrants and the horde of liquors, as she had to protect her legion and friends as well. She knew that most of these zombies were just nuisances. Let's end this and head back. Invicta spoke as the others nodded as several zombies were rushing towards him, these were C-Virus zombies. These were older variants of the Javos as they attacked the group. The C-Virus causes extreme mutations in humans, though different strains can induce different kinds of mutations. The C-Virus contains certain genes from the G-Virus that allow it to restore living functions to the previously deceased. As a result, if the virus is released within a gas, it can revive former corpses as zombies, and, if preserved well enough, this can happen centuries after their original death. Another aspect taken from the G-Virus is the ability to mutate into another organism after initial mutation, though it may do so by expressing genes from that particular strain. Intelligence remains in hosts to a greater extent than T-Virus strains. Immediately reacting, they all started to fire at the zombies, who were mutated enough to start regenerating, Issei also unleashed a flame wall to burn any zombies that came close to them. The troopers kept firing on the zombies. Eventually they were killing several more of them with ease. Kaneko added more of the grenades, as Ria's assisted with the demonic destruction magic balls as they were completely destroyed, eventually only resulting in one of them left, as Issei burned the last zombie alive. Kaneko, fire a rocket launcher on the ceiling, make sure no zombie attacks us in any way. 
Kaneko nodded in understanding as she did so. The rocket exploded as the debris fell on the floor blocking anything that came in the way. The group sighed in relief as they all headed outside, Issei soon created a portal heading him back to the Arcadian briefing room. This was made by you? Inko asked with surprise as Issei nodded, he then spoke, I have created one access portal for John and another for me and my team, that is why our missions were able to happen in such record time. Inko nodded, he truly lived up to the title of the Mage of Arcadia. Let's end this mission and go home speaking of which, how many casualties in the 501st and Shadow Company? How many casualties? Issei asked Elias who responded, 10 soldiers were killed amongst the Legion, many more would have been killed had it not been for Midoriya assisting us. Issei clenched his fist in anger, before taking a deep breath calming himself down, he thanked Inko for saving his troops. Thank you, Wesker 3. Inko only gave a smile and spoke, no need to thank me general, let's get out of here. Issei and the others entered the portal, as they disappeared into nothingness, they were able to get out of the area safely. 430. Chris Redfield and the original 15 were waiting for Issei and the 501st, as they all arrived back at the base, they were greeted by John and Chris, as Chris asked, so did you get the samples? Issei nodded as he gave it to Redfield, who looked at it, opening the samples and spoke, job well done, 501st Legion, good thing you made it back, alive Issei Shadow Company Issei nodded as they looked towards Elizabeth, Lily then asked, is she? Issei explained, Carmilla's pet projects, she was the monster we had to face, hopefully we can help her since she is not a zombie. Many of the original 15 were angry at this, with John being the most angriest, the girl did not deserve what was coming to him. The BSAA and the Arcadian Technology Institute will help, until then, I would suggest we put her under restraint such that she is unable to use her attacks upon us. Chris responded as Violet asked, are you sure we should be keeping her alive, General? For all we know, she could be a problem to Arcadia, given that she was Carmilla's test subjects. Violet's words were agreed by many as Issei responded, I understand your concerns Captain Evergarden, but you can be assured, she will be under my personal care, anything she does. I will take full and sole responsibility of it. The reason is that she is from my own world and it is best she would stay with us for the time being. Violet nodded in understanding as Issei looked towards Chris and asked, Redfield, can you contact me whenever she wakes up? Chris nodded and responded, I will. Issei gave the unconscious Elizabeth Lyons to Chris who put her down on a nearby sofa, he immediately contacted some medics to take her to a medical center so that she can recover. Anyways, everyone good job on securing Raccoon City, everyone has been evacuated and the bombing of the city will begin shortly, we need to destroy it, otherwise the bows will reach towards the other cities as well. None of them seemed happy with this, but they all nodded in understanding, as moments pass and the bombing of the city had begun. In mere minutes bombs were dropped onto Raccoon City, completely destroying and killing every last bow that was present there, none of them made it out alive. The people watching this could only clench their fists in anger and helplessness. John, Lily, Issei and Violet were the angriest seeing how many lives the Black Arms along with Umbrella had wiped out without any mercy, giving them a fate far worse than death. All this happened was because of Nicholas and Carmilla, the former was able to infiltrate the heart of the Empress and manipulate her for so long. The video feed showed the ruins of Raccoon City as it completely cuts off. They knew that they had to defeat Nicholas at all costs. Scene change. Time skip brought to you by Chibi Issei looking at a weird tape he found. Juniper's personal room, 11.30 am, Juniper was seated on the table, with Issei present on the opposite to her. Issei had briefed her about Elizabeth as she gave her own words. I see so she is from your world as well. Juniper spoke while suppressing her anger, the Black Arms not only managed to find Issei's old planet before they did. Not only that, she was experimented on as well, Issei never told her about Elizabeth, so there was no telling if she was like Gabriel or not. Indeed, Juniper she is from my world as well. Carmilla was able to get her hands on her and experiment on her, and my guess is she was not the only one that Carmilla managed to get her hands on Issei then continued. My guess is that several more of them were experimented on and either they may be alive or dead worse, I think this was how the Black Arms came to know about my past. Juniper listened intently, she hated Nicholas even more for doing this. She was under his spell for so long that she failed to notice what he was doing. He was working against her this whole time, sabotaging her entire family and kingdom. I see all we can do is hope she is fine since she was not Carmilla's only subjects, and creations even Willow and the Wesker squadron were, too Issei nodded in agreement as he responded, I know, all I can do is help her but there is something that scares me too. Juniper looked at him with concern and responded, what? Issei looked at her and spoke, I fear that the Black Arms may contact the faction leaders and try to bring them to their side given their hatred for Nyx and Hades, they will do anything in their power to capture them, I did inform you about their pasts as well, right? 
Juniper nodded, she was aware of their actions, due to her talking with Issei and him starting to not hide his past anymore, but with how much they have contributed to Arcadia, especially Kingdom of Hell, she was able to see that they are on her side. Same goes for Nyx, she trusted her due to her being associated with Issei, and she knew that none of them will cause any problems to them, since they are also assisting Arcadia in the Civil War. Not to mention, you know why they would want to capture me right? I told you about die, right? Juniper nodded as she spoke, yeah he would want you back since he would be struggling to maintain his image back home. No matter say, if they joined the Black Arms they would be swiftly dealt with. Juniper spoke coldly, she never had any empathy for the faction leaders anyway. Issei nodded in understanding, as he could only pity what would be coming for them next. Anyway, Ice, don't think about it too much. You should head back and get some sleep. Issei nodded in response as Juniper spoke. Regardless, I saw the mission report Jean had sent me just before you came, and I must say. Good job. I thank you. Juniper only gave a smile and spoke. You even found a way to infiltrate the Black Arms and successfully get the samples, but you should head to sleep. You have been awake the whole night. I understand, Juniper Issei spoke as he teleported out of there, leaving Juniper alone, she did not know what to say, but she would take what Issei said into account, if his words were true, and if the Black Arms were to recruit the faction leaders, they need to be dealt with swiftly and accordingly, and they will be stopped in case they become a problem. Chapter 24. Angel Far From Home, two days later, Issei's office, Arcadian Military Headquarters, 9.30 am, Issei was seated in his office, it's been a day since the funeral of the 500 first soldiers that were killed in the raccoon city, courtesy of the bows, he was working on some of the paperwork that was remaining in the aftermath. So far, things in the war have been starting to form in the side of the Arcadians yet again, as they managed to win against the settlement defense front and managed to deal with Salen Koch. However, the Outer Heaven and the Atlas Corporation were still being a major problem, to the Arcadians causing numerous casualties, and then there was the Black Arms that was still a problem as well. Issei sighed, he was a general for a month now, and things have been going on well for now. He had come back from the funeral for the fallen alongside the rest of the 500 first, as they vowed to avenge all those that they have lost. So partner how are those strategies playing out? Drake asked Issei who responded, I'd say pretty well. I mean, I did learn from what Elsha and Belzard had done and developed my own variants, who knew low magic teleportation circles would not only reduce casualties, but also have a higher success rate in the missions. Issei mused as Drag spoke, regardless, they would have been so proud of what you have turned into. Yeah Issei spoke with a sad tone, they were almost akin to his own mentors, and he wished for them to be present even now, he remembered their encouraging words before they sacrificed themselves, so that he could live. You are the best person I can call a student, and as a mentor to his student, I can say my final words live well, eat well, sleep well, train well and most of all, live your own life, and live it happily, Alsha spoke while embracing him before her soul was destroyed to keep Issei's alive. You are the next generation, our time has long passed. A thousand generations of suffering and despair end with your arrival. Don't let anyone ruin that for you. Issei. Belzard spoke while ruffling Issei's hair as his soul gets destroyed. Greg knew how much those two meant for him, as he had spoken, partner they wouldn't want you to become this sad, you know. Issei nodded as he spoke, yeah I guess you are right Drag chuckled, as suddenly the phone rang, he picked up the phone and spoke. Yes. The one who had called was Elias, who had spoken, general, your family has come to visit you, should I send them in? Sure, send them, I am free, right now Issei responded as he cuts the call. Time has passed as Hades, Persephone, Melano and Macaria came inside the room, Issei gets up and before he could greet. Persephone greets him with a massive hug that almost causes him to fall down, as Persephone exclaimed. Ice Chan I missed you so much Persephone did not change much in the past two years, she still looked the same, except her clothing which was now comprised of petal crowns around her shoulders, a bluish black dress, which had a design pattern in the form of a herbless. She had worn a brown skirt with its insides being red and brown slacks that extended all the way up her upper thighs, attached by a clothing that she had worn. Her shoulder sleeves were white, and her dress was fully sleeved. She also wore a necklace that had a ruby at its center. I missed you too, Mom Issei returned the embrace, Hades's family is the one he can call his own true family. The reason Issei called Persephone Mom was because of a request she had, she was reluctant on putting it forward, but Issei asked and was persistent. When this was told, Issei was happy to call Persephone his mother and Hades, his father. He did see them as his family, and he didn't mind calling them that, much to their happiness. Soon after the group settled down, as Persephone split up from Issei, who had finally had some breathing room. He noticed Hades has barely changed unlike Persephone and his daughters, well they had a complete makeover. Now Melano wore a tactical army gear, she wore a white military t-shirt, with gloves. She wore a bulletproof vest and black pants. There were several pouches that had gun bullets or guns along with grenades. 
Balmakaria wore something similar, but her shirt was black and she wore a belt with multiple pouches, they had just recently integrated into the military. Wow, you two look completely different, Melano, Makaria. The girl smiled as Melano responded. I am glad you liked it, Ice Chan, or I guess I should say General, the girl soon got up as they had spoken with a salute. Private Melano and Makaria, reporting for duty, Sir Issei, Persephone and Hades smiled at this, as Issei spoke, at ease privates. The two sisters felt relaxed as Issei spoke, regardless, which battalion are you two a part of? Supreme General assigned the two of us to your battalion, since each of the 501st Legion have different battalions and subdivisions, so we are now part of your battalion. Issei thought for a moment and spoke with a shrug, sure, why not plus Nyx would be happy to have you around. The girl smiled in happiness, as Persephone asked. Who else is part of the battalion aside from Nyx? Issei spoke, the one whom you met downstairs, Elias Greystone and Invictus for now and then the two of you. Then Rias has her own shadow company, and Ingvold has her own battalion that are affiliated with us. And Ingvold has her own battalion, followed by Kiba, who has his own subdivisions, you name it. Issei spoke, as Hades spoke with a tone of surprise. I was surprised when Rias existed in this world, she is nothing like the spoiled brat of our world, and is actually respectful and reserved, she treats her superiors with utmost respect and I was surprised to see that she also has a sister, instead of Serzich's Hades spoke remembering meeting her whole family in the kingdom of demons. Hades currently has a very high position in the kingdom, due to his works and efforts. Despite his past terrorism actions, his achievements couldn't be overlooked as he fought for the kingdom when the Black Arms invaded them, almost multiple times. He has met several demons including one of them who is stated the strongest demon. He was El Diablos, or better known as Diablo. The prime evil, the lord of terror, the leader of the great evils, and the ruler of hell. You are right, I learned that the Arcadian variants of the people from our old world are nothing like the ones from our old world, they are separate people, even Ingvold, who was completely different. Melano asked with a surprised tone, wait, Ingvold too. The Hades' family were familiar about what the old world Ingvold did to her. They knew that Ingvold was the one that broke Issei, her being good was something they will always be surprised with, as Issei brought out a can of Diet Coke and took a swig of it. Yep. Issei then spoke as he continued, turns out she is a half-elf, half-demon, and she is nothing like our Ingvold, she is loyal and helpful, and is a shadow of the Empress, before joining the 501st, she still is a shadow, and will help the Empress whenever she requires it. I see Melano spoke with a tone of surprise as Makaria added, I wonder who else is a part of this. Well we have Kaneko and Aika as well, and they are a part of the Shadow Company, basically under Rhea's command. Makaria was surprised before responded, I see I did hear about the Shadow Company from Dad, so that is another thing. Both Melano and Makaria would love to meet them, they knew that Rhea's was different, and there is a high chance that the others are also different. Issei then spoke. Anyways, I wanted to speak to you about something Issei spoke while looking towards Hades as he asked, what is the matter, Ice? It's a long story Dad, you might want to be seated for this one. Hades and his family pondered on what this could mean, as Issei explained everything that had happened, they were aware of the black arms coming to know of Issei's past, and were livid when Nicholas used it against him. However they were surprised on how Issei came to know about this, as Issei had revealed about Elizabeth Lyons, who was captured and experimented on by Carmilla. They were angered by what Carmilla had done, knowing she had a hand in the gas attack that had claimed so many lives, including almost killing Charon and Thanatos. I see Hades mused as he sighed, seems like Gabriel is doing a shit job back home, if she can let a bunch of terrorists kidnap and experiment on her. It seems like she is not even competent enough to do so. Yep, you got that one right, Hades. Persephone spoke with an annoyed tone, just how incompetent she can get if she was kidnapped like this it seems like being with that bastard Dai has corrupted her brain so much, she fails to see her whole life falling apart. I seriously wish that she sees on what kind of a person Dai is she has the tools, she just doesn't want to use it. Makaria spoke coldly as Melano added, you got that one right, sis. Honestly, I won't be surprised she would be shattered if she finds that one out but with Dai controlling her, I doubt she would even see that Elizabeth is gone. Melano's words were agreed by the rest of her family as Hades spoke, and worse, what is Michael even doing, shouldn't he be his job to make sure his people is safe? Persephone then added with a mocking tone. He is, but with Dai controlling the leaders like dogs, I doubt they are doing anything worth it I am pretty sure they would be hunting you, and Nyx for your crimes, Hades agreed to that as he responded. You are right on that one, Purse Hades soon turned around to Issei and spoke, so what would you do with Elizabeth, Issei? I am not sure, hell I don't know what she is thinking right now, whether she is on our side or not Willow Sensei told me about on how Carmilla is known to break people, I fear that she will attack us on instinct, Hades noted as he spoke. I see Hades then added his own words, be careful with her, you may have broken her armor, but the experimentation gave her a unique light that can affect her use hypnosis to knock her out. 
Bisse nodded as suddenly he had gotten a call from Chris Redfield as he spoke, excuse me. The others nodded as he spoke, yes captain. General, the angel is gaining consciousness, she is still in restraint such that she is unable to use her powers. You can meet her if you wish to do so. Chris responded as Issei thought for a moment and responded, very well, I will be there. Issei cuts the call off and he speaks, turns out Elizabeth is awake, I will be visiting her soon. In that case, I will let Melano and Macaria settle down in the army and meet with the Nicks and the others. Hades spoke, as Issei nodded, he soon decided to take a transport to Arcadia. This was of Toll which was a transport that constantly traveled around. It was Vulture, Issei's personal Toll. Arcadian Transport, 10.30 am. Issei was seated in his transport as he was heading towards the location, he was looking through his scroll, as he was looking through images that he was seeing belonging to his time in Arcadia, as well as some others that brought back some happy memories. He saw an image of his grandfather, Juzo Haidu, or more accurately his younger self. He was described to be a brown-haired man with a balbo beard and a mustache. He wore a brown suit, a light brown waistcoat and a white shirt and tie. He also wore a brown formal pants. Grandpa. Issei spoke with a solemn tone, the only man that believed in him, despite Goru and the rest of his family minus his grandmother, declaring him to be worthless. His grandmother was missing for a very long time. I hope you are watching me grandpa now I have become a general, and I am living my life happily than before, Issei mused as he gave a smile, remembering that his grandfather was the one that kept motivating him to keep moving on. Yuzo was one of the prodigy mages of the old world, he was serious and stern, but he was also kind-hearted and compassionate. He hated arrogance and those that looked down upon him, this was true for the family of the five principal clans, as a result he humiliated them and defeated their leaders together, he was also nicknamed the god magician, due to his massive magical talent and abilities. But like with all legends, his came to an end when he succumbed to old age. That was when his son Goru and his two brothers took over his clan, much to his sadness and anger. He knew that his clan will have a dark age, and he knew that it won't go away for a long time, but when he saw Issei, he knew he had hope. Issei did not have arrogance like his brothers and cared for him, he treated and loved Issei despite him being disowned, a rule that Juzo managed to abolish, but Goru brought it back, much to his hatred, but given that he was weak, he had to relent. When he died, that was the day when Issei's dark life began, until he met some people and headed to Arcadia. But now, his life is turning for the better, he has people that care for him and others that love and cherish him, even the Empress is someone he would cherish and protect. He soon scrolled the image hoping to see some more of his grandfather, only to be met with an image that made him lose his smile, as it changed to anger. It was when Issei and Irina were younger. He thought she was a friend, but that was a lie. I really need to clean up my scroll. Issei spoke coldly, as he remembered on how his so-called childhood friend betrayed him. Seen change, flashback dot dot 16 years ago. A small Issei 5 years and Arena 5 years was playing around, back then Issei presumed Arena to be a male, as he called her. Shidu Arena turned around and spoke, yes Issei. So you will be leaving today. Arena nodded as she responded sadly. Yes Issei, I will be going today, it was quite fun playing with you, Arena responded as Issei called out to her, but her parents came, who were Tauji and Mina Shidu as Tauji spoke, we need to leave Arena. Arena looked at her parents and nodded, as she spoke, goodbye Issei. Goodbye Shidu, Issei spoke sadly as he continued, Shidu, please promise me, we will meet again, right? We will, Issei, we will. Irina responded, as they soon left leaving Issei alone to deal with his miserable family. He had to go back, since that was the last time he would be seeing her, anyways. But fate does work in mysterious ways. Time skip 13 years later. Irina and Dai were talking to each other, as Irina greeted him, hey Dai, it's been such a long time since we have met. You bet, Irina Chan say don't you have someone else to meet as well. Irina thought for a moment and responded, not really. They say. Dai spoke with a mocking grin as Irina responded, oh him, I could care less on what he does, if anything I came primarily for you. Both laughed, as Issei heard everything and walked away dejected, another abandoned him for his brother. He was thinking of showing her something, but he was glad he saw the reality of his so-called friend. Greg was furious at Irina for letting this happen, however, as for now he could only console and calm down Issei now. Flashback ends. Scene change. Issei looked at the image and sighed, he soon deleted the image, seeing that it was just a waste of space. Soon enough, an announcement was heard from the pilot of the Vtol. We are currently landing in the base general. Issei nodded as he spoke, yes, please stay here till I come back. As you wish, general. Issei got up and headed down from the Vtol. He had informed Juniper Pryor who said that she would be bringing two people that would help Elizabeth. Scene change. The SAA base, Arcadian military base, 1.30 pm. The vulture soon landed as Issei got down, as he was greeted by Juniper, Shaiho and Citri. 
They were accompanied by another person, she was Sherry Birkins, who was described to be a blonde-haired woman with blue eyes. She seemed to be wearing winter clothing. I say, we have been waiting for you. Juniper spoke with a smile as he greeted the rest. In a while, Juniper, Wesker II and Wesker led. Both Shiho and Citri shook their heads, and Citri responded, Please General, call us by our first names, Citri and points to Shiho Shiho. Very well, for me, call me Issei, the two nodded in response, as he looked at Sherry as Shiho introduced her, meet Sherry Birkins, an agent of Arcadia, and recently transferred to the BSAA. Birkin? Meaning you are Issei continues as Sherry speaks, yes Issei, I am the daughter of William Birkin, but unlike him I chose to fight against bioterrorism, Umbrella is what made my parents' legacy, and I am not going to make it mine. Issei nodded remembering Jade telling him about William Birkin's hand in making the T-virus, and the discovery of the G-virus, or the Golgotha virus, he understood that she was not going to let her family's legacy be hers. I see, Sherry nodded, as he spoke, well it is nice to meet you too Miss Sherry. Thus call me Sherry, and I believe Redfield called you here for the one you call Elizabeth Lyons. Sherry responded, as Issei spoke, yes, how is she doing? She is doing fine, she just has woken up, but her body composure, it is not like anything BSAA has encountered the good thing is that, there is fortunately no recorded virus present in her body. Sherry's words made the guests sigh in relief. However, her body has been mutated and strengthened beyond comprehension, there was manipulation of the cells, almost akin to how the cells mutated in the bodies of the Wesker squadron, implying that she is fast and strong, almost akin to the Wesker squadron. Issei noted as he could sense anger from both Shiho and Citri, meaning she was a victim of Carmela. They hated on how many lives has she ruined in the name of science. Not to mention, there was traces of magic in her body, she had magic slaying light which comprised of dragon slaying, demon slaying, angel slaying, and many more comprised inside of her body. Issei noted what Sherry was saying, as he knew this to be true. He and Rias were injured when Elizabeth released her light onto them. Ingvold was able to escape due to her creating a magic barrier which protected them. Very well then, anything else we need to know before we head inside. Issei asked after a thought as Sherry spoke, none, none whatsoever, Captain Redfield will continue from here on out. In that case, lead the way Sherry. Sherry nodded as they all headed inside the BSAA base, as they all kept walking. Many of the military men were working tirelessly to find a cure to the virus samples that the 501st was able to retrieve. He soon reached the table where Chris Redfield was looking at Elizabeth who had a lost look on her face. Ah General, I was waiting for you, Issei looked at Chris and nodded, as he asked, so how is she? Better than before, she was surprised to see us, but due to the restraints we were able to talk to her and inform her that she was safe. She did not divulge on what Carmilla did to her, nor did she inform what was going on, only thing we know is her name, Elizabeth Lyons Issei nodded as Juniper spoke, so I believe you can take it from here, right? Issei nodded and spoke to Chris, Captain, let me be the one to talk to her, I will see if I can get something out of her I want to know how is she all the way in Arcadia. Chris looked at Issei for a moment as he spoke with a neutral tone, very well, she is all yours. Thank you Redfield. Issei soon walked inside the room as Elizabeth looked surprised. She took a moment and spoke, Issei. So you do recognize me, don't you? Elizabeth looked at her and nodded, Juniper and the others were watching him, the former knowing that this was something that he would have to confront his past again. She hoped he would handle it better than before. So how did you fall into the hands of the Black Arms? Elizabeth looked for a moment as she held her head in pain, remembering the torture Carmilla put her through, the others watched helplessly as Chris, Shiho and Citri clenched their fists in anger. Juniper gritted her teeth in fury knowing what Carmilla and Nicholas did to her, while Sherry looked at her sadly. Issei acted quickly as he quickly rubbed her back while speaking. It's okay, it's okay, she is not going to harm you any longer, Elizabeth kept crying, Issei remembered them to have never had an encounter, since Issei was too blind for Gabriel until her betrayal. He hated Gabriel for being this careless causing her to be in such a state. He used some soothing magic to calm her down, assuring that everything would be fine. If you don't wish to talk, let's talk about something else like, how did the angel faction became after I left or more accurately, how Gabriel became Elizabeth looked at Issei, as she wiped her tears and spoke, I don't know more time she spent, was with Dai Haidu, at first I did not bother but she had started to become more distant I understand that she was busy due to the cow's brigade that all changed that fateful day. What day? Issei asked as he motioned one of the scientists to give him the bottle of water, he nodded as he gave the bottle, as he poured a glass and spoke, take a drink, and calm down, speak normally, we are not in a hurry. Elizabeth nodded as she drank some water, she kept the glass down, and Issei spoke, it's okay Elizabeth, you are safe here, and no black arms will harm you ever again. I Elizabeth looked at him and nodded, he had no reason for being this kind to her, she had heard Gabriel speak about him, not only she did not completely trust Issei, due to them never having an encounter, 
but also nothing she spoke matched the man that was in front of her, she decided to tell the truth, having no reason to hide. I will inform everything Lady Gabriel sent us for this mission, where we were asked to deal with the Cow's Brigade insurgents, but in reality, the Black Arms captured me and several others, Issei became wide-eyed, as he could only imagine what happened seeing Elizabeth's sad expression. So what happened? Elizabeth spoke while crying, as she responded, the Black Arms experimented on us and captured us, they came to know about our homeworld and past. The woman Carmilla, she tortured us, experimented on us, and abused us, she did not care what we thought or wanted. We begged for her mercy, but she did not have any dot dot I beg for God, anyone that would come and save us, but no one came. The angels, my brothers and sisters died one by one. Until I was the only one left, only one that was able to handle the experimentation, the only one that made it out, alive I eventually broke and became a servant of the same woman that made me like this, made me, the angel. Elizabeth spoke while looking at her mechanical wings, her old angelic wings were gone as she spoke. Look at me Issei, they did this to me, please, I will do anything, I don't wish to go back, please save me, Elizabeth exclaimed while holding on to Issei's vest, Issei saw the desperation in her eyes, she would do anything just to make sure she does not fall into Carmilla's hands. He was beyond angry at three people Gabriel and Michael, for being this negligent and Carmilla, the mastermind that broke Elizabeth. In his anger, his dragon scales were showing as Drag sent some soothing energy to calm him down. I see Elizabeth looked at him wondering what is his decision going to be as he spoke, I can assure you, you will no longer suffer, you are safe here in Arcadia, where the Black Arms or Carmilla cannot reach you. Elizabeth looked towards Issei as she started to cry on his vest. Issei rubbed her back, calming her down, he hated what she had gone through and made sure that she would be alright. After a while, she calmed down as she spoke with an apologetic tone. Sorry for ruining your clothing. Issei shook his head and responded, it's fine not to worry. He looked towards Juniper and she nodded, she motioned both Shiho and Citri to head inside. Juniper couldn't help but be proud of him once again not letting his past decide his choices. He was starting to get over his past, and soon it will be nothing but history. The trio soon went inside as Elizabeth looked at them and spoke, who are you people? I am Juniper Ark, the Empress of Arcadia, it is nice to meet you Elizabeth Lyons Elizabeth nodded, she soon bowed in greeting as she spoke, I am sorry for, don't be Elizabeth, we heard everything, and we know for what happened to you I would like to apologize for what my former husband Nicholas did to you, Elizabeth was surprised as she asked, he is your husband. That man, he is nothing but a monster he and Carmilla enjoyed when my brothers and sisters died, Elizabeth spoke with a bit of fear as Juniper looked down with sadness, another life was ruined by Nicholas. He has done a lot of damage to Arcadia and many others, and he had to pay. Juniper soon turned her gaze to Elizabeth and spoke, Elizabeth, he is not going to harm you anymore, and you are not the first I helped with. And to make amends, please let me help you Elizabeth. I will fix everything, the damage that Nicholas done, he will pay, but before that, I will help you settle down in Arcadia. Elizabeth looked at her a moment, she had faith in his say, but Juniper, she was not sure to do so. Seeing this Juniper knew what she had to do as she spoke, let me tell you something Elizabeth, you are not the only one who was a victim of that woman known as Carmilla. Juniper looked at Shiho and Citri as she continued, meet two more of Carmilla's victims or creations as she calls it, the two members of Wesker squadron. That being Citri Eisner and Shiho Nishizumi. Elizabeth looked at the two as they walked forward as Citri spoke, as her highness had spoken, I am the leader of the Wesker squadron, we were a part of the Wesker project, and we know how you feel people didn't survive the Wesker squadron, and we were lucky for surviving this. Lions listen, we know how you feel and you were just another victim, but we are willing to help you settle down. If you wish to live a normal civilian life too, we wouldn't mind. Shiho spoke as Citri added. Right now we are in the state of war, but we can make arrangements allowing you to settle down here her highness, and general can help you, do so so Elizabeth, what do you say? Elizabeth looked at them, they were kindred spirits. She looked at Issei, as he gave a nod. He trusted them, and she could also have faith in them. I accept Elizabeth spoke with a smile, as she got up. Juniper motioned the scientists to remove the restraints off her, as she soon got up and started to walk out with Shiho and Citri, they decided to help her, and give her a normal life, or any life she chooses. I must admit you did well to help her I can't even imagine the suffering she went through. Juniper spoke sadly as Issei responded, yeah and Gabriel, I never thought she would become this negligent. I understand your anger ice, but I will be honest with you you helped her a lot, and I believe just like you, time will heal her wounds as well, Juniper spoke as she continued, not only that, your actions allowed the 1-5 to finally defeat Nikolai and his UBCS, catching them off guard and allowing a well-timed victory. I, thank you Juniper, Juniper gave a smile as Issei spoke, I will be heading back, Melano and Makaria have joined the army, and it would be nice to help them settle down. Very well. Issei spoke while heading outside back to his toll, he waved his goodbyes to the Empress as she returned it.
She looked at Issei, happy that his smile was becoming more and more genuine as time passes by. Scene change. Black Arms Base, Outlands, 3.30 p.m. Nicholas Ark or Kane was reading the reports of the incident that happened in Umbrella. He seemed angry knowing that the 500 first led by Issei was becoming as problematic as the 1-5 led by his son John Ark. The two teams were becoming a massive problem to the sum. Amit Nicholas slammed the table in anger, Arcadia was starting to gain an advantage now, he wanted to kill Issei with his bare hands for not only scaring his face, but for ruining his plans and everything. However just as he was about to do anything, a call came in from Black Arm's private channels as he picked it up. This call belonged to the Outer Heaven. Yes dot 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 I see very well, Liquid, we will begin the conquest of Earth 8 and gain more territory and resources for our own goals. Nicholas spoke with a grin, he cuts the call and starts making plans for invading Earth 8, which was an important Arcadian location, but due to the outer heaven it was becoming a problem, as soon enough Carmilla came inside as she spoke, are the beauty and the beast ready? Carmilla nodded as she wrapped her arms around Nicholas and spoke, they are. The duo soon made out, since no one was present, the kiss lasted for a while. They soon split up as Carmilla spoke, they will make sure we forward our goals, no matter what happens. We will get rid of Earth 8 which had a major Arcadian base, and no one will stop us. Nicholas only gave a dark grin knowing full well on what will happen. He was certainly going to enjoy conquering Earth 8 no matter what happens. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.